All right, we are live. Now we're live. Yeah, something oh, was wrong with. I was trying to stream it in a higher quality, and uh, of course, I can't do that. <laughs> Why would that work? Silly me. I mean, um, um, so I was experimenting with like a OBS after I left on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Did you do any? You didn't do. Uh, I did. did. I got it all set up. I got it all finally set up, and did then you? I, I have. Yeah. So I have it all prepared, but uh, I haven't gotten around to playing with it more. It's okay. I'm sorry. Right. I feel bad about ditching you because I wanted to play with things. And, yeah. and then I kind of played with some of the stuff on my end and stuff like that. Um, don't forget, you can load videos up on that Twitch channel, so you can load this thing up on Twitch. And, okay. Yeah. I will, uh, I'll I'll probably start doing that. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber on Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. And in exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. And if you're $25 and above, you even get a cool poster, which I mailed out to uh, about... 15 people the other day, so... Thanks, Christy. Yeah, so those should be coming out. Thanks to Christy a Avery for uh, helping put those together. This show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag WALnews or in our Facebook group or Discord channel. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. Please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. In this show, we're going to talk about uh, daylight savings time, the shooting in Texas. We're going to talk about the bizarre happenings with Rand Paul. Uh, but first, I want to introduce my co-host for the Tuesday show, as always, is Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good, going good. Got a sl small little headache, but I'm, you know, each shot of whiskey makes it better. You are, you smell like a booze factory over there. Well, um, Gunther's going through teething, so the only thing that helps me out and her out is um, whiskey. <laughs> yeah, you you're quite you you are uh, you're 45 minutes late because you had a flat tire. Flat tire. Yep. 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 You had a baby screaming in your ear all day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you uh, what what else? Uh, my sister was supposed to also take Gunther so it could help me do show prep, but she bailed on me because she had to. Um, she forgot she had to move one of her sorority members. Okay. You know, so we know which family's you know more superior to her. Uh huh. You know, blood over Greeks. Yeah. Speak of Greeks. But um, <laughs> never trust a Greek. Yep. No show in Agnos. But other than that, you know, that was about Chloe. By the way, don't don't no, no. start bullshit. Oh yeah, forgot we gotta go Chloe. <laughs> um, you're just and then you brought in a chair today. Oh yes, I finally have got my chair in. I finally brought the chair in. Uh, it's my really nice chair that I got from an unknown location um, several years ago. Shout out to Min. Um, it's comfy. It's 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 a restaurant chair. It's a church pew chair. It's not a church pew chair. It's got, it's got a da It's got a damn communion cup on the side. That's um. See, that's there to hold the shots. All right, okay? okay. That's holding the shots. You you've been ready. You've been on, and I'll post a picture of uh harry's chair up on the instagram everybody will be very confused who isn't listening to this episode but i'll post that up there so you can see harry's chair i'm i i and i did this on the instagram stories the uh half of my table uh <laughs> half of my table hold on jeff Fibbert's going to facetime in uh we need to we need to talk to, to little jeff Fibbert. What? so facetime in let's see if this works uh that's who facetimed in just a just a moment ago um I uh, have half my table for lights and cameras, so I have two chairs that I can't find. Now I've got three chairs that I have to rehome and relocate. Well, the fireplace is going. The fireplace is going. Uh, we're both very tired today. I had. Jeff, can you hear me? Hello, Jeffrey. Yep. Nope. This isn't going to work. It's unfortunate. Talking about things you missed. Yep. We miss Jeff. We miss Jeff, <laughs> little Jeff Fibbert. Uh All right. So, yes, Harry and I are both very tired. Yeah. You're, you're tired. Me more than baby. you. Of course. How is it with a baby? Uh, it's it's a joy to have. The random schedules. Um, I am, but it, it's great having a kid. Um, it's more of the randomness that just pops up, like the things you read about or 
Like, it's not as bad. Like, it's not colic. If someone, if you're dealing with a colicky baby, I, I trust me, my day's better than yours. Of course. <laughs> and I feel bad for you. But because I do get those moments of, you know, I like just utter just quiet and then unconsolable anger. <laughs> Why? Because, <laughs> you know, she's teething or she's upset or she wants my attention and I try not and I'm not giving it to her. Or right. she'll wake up or the worst possible thing, which, you know, is um, I didn't put the um, EO ad blocker on the uh, on the tablet. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, but uh, Joe uh, had her listen to Joe Rogan. She was falling asleep, and then it kicked to an ad, and she woke up, and she was very angry at that ad. <laughs> She's very opinionated. Very, for, yeah. For, for how old? Uh, six months now. Yeah, so she's woke. Pure woke. She's six very months. woke. Very woke at six months, you know. So she's very upset, and uh, usually I, then I try to put on, like, the like those nursery rhymes. She wasn't having it, you know, because the, the match just kind of made her upset. But other than that. We're gonna, because she gets up at, she'll go to sleep right at ten o'clock, and then she'll be asleep, and then about one o'clock, you know, randomly she'll wake up once in a while. Not right. all, not every time, but it seems like every time I want to go to bed before one o'clock, she'll wake up. <laughs> <laughs> but if I stay up to like two a.m., yeah, she'll sleep through it. So we have something called Patreon, which you can subscribe to help. Uh, hold on, we're getting a phone call. Hello? Okay. Who's this? What's up? Oh, hi, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Spangle? Not, not bad. What do you want? Uh, I don't know. Ratings are so bad for Wall that you have to answer my phone call during the broadcast. <laughs> you're such a little prick. <laughs> I, I'd just like to say you used to answer my calls when you're on air. Jeff Vibbert of Barstool Heartland, uh, number one podcast in the land, correct? Yep, no big deal. Uh, like my third number one podcast. Cause they call me Scott Storch of Podcast. So I just cranked out a hit. If you've never looked at Scott Storch's Instagram, it's hilarious. He's just like this old weird dude now who just plays on his piano. It's so I could watch it for hours watching Scott Storch. I went, a, I went through a weird rabbit hole the other day of just watching Scott Storch videos. Yeah. And he, he looks like an amphibious creature that like escaped from a lab. He's a weird looking guy. Now, uh, Jeff, you are, of, of, again, of Heartland Radio, great podcast, and uh, I'm glad that you could, you have, how many Twitter followers now? Uh, it's over 25,000, Bengal, look. Still not verified. I didn't call in and talk about me, though. I came in, I called in and talked about you. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great. Everything's great. Harry's grumpy, though. He's drinking heavily. He's, Uh-oh. What he, are you drinking? Uh, Jim Bean Honey. Jim Bean Honey. Straight yeah. Up. Just taking shots. Just Good to talk to you, Harry. Uh, do, do you guys, do you guys have any black co-hosts over there? We don't. We could use one. Yeah. We could use a female, we could use a black female co-host. A That's black female question. co-host. I'm sure, uh, sh- what's, hit, go ahead. Hit, hit a couple demographics there. That'd be amazing. All right. Well, we have to go. I can Caitlyn Jenner you, sir? if need be. I'm enjoying this conversation. J- Jeff loves to call in in the middle of our podcast. Once on our live show episode, uh, the last live show, just call in. I think you've called in on every live show. Back when Wall was Wall. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> See, Jeff loves. I, I love. I love the new format. I, I, I still love the show. I, I watch all the highlights on YouTube. Check it out. It's great. Wall is doing big things. I love it. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, Jeff loves. He's in Dear Leaders Court, which is for our ten dollar a month and up subscribers. But I put him in there just for fun, and he loves to comment on every single episode. The show was so much better when Cat and Greg were on it. And then he goes to a different. And then he goes to a different video and will say, "This show's so much better now that." <laughs> like he just he just <laughs> shit posts. I had no idea that I was behind a paywall. That's amazing. Yeah, you got VIP Good access. VIP access, bro. You're, I'm in the VIP club. I didn't know you had a VIP section. Good for you guys. I'm proud of what you guys are doing. <laughs> All right. Goodbye. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have lost, uh, Stone mentions Jeff's rant, the last, uh, not the last time, but the time before when Jeff was on the show, at the end, there was a little Easter egg where Jeff went off, and I wish I could find that audio, man, when he went off about basically where he worked at the time, my current employer, which is why we buried it, it was just insane, he, he was so funny. 
It'll, uh, it'll come back once uh, you know he runs for office or something else happens. Yeah, <laughs> Vibs Vibs is uh, a good kid, good friend, mm-hmm. and I'm so happy to see him have so much success. And thank you for uh, deigning to yeah. lower yourself to <laughs> come on, we are libertarians. We'll wake up at 3 a.m. and call him in the middle of things you miss. We'll show him. Now we're we're breaking format. We've we've been chit chatting for a little longer than we normally do, so we got to get into it. But one of the reasons I'm just like pooped, I'm so tired, and it's because of daylight savings time. Mm-hmm. And I have it, it's one of those like weird things that doesn't really matter that people get super pissed off about. Like it I, it's not a distraction, but it's just one of those things that people irrationally get mad about. I I don't know if you've noticed this, but but you're one of those people who just gets mad about this. This is why we're talking about it first. Here is like we were talking about daylight saving time on this program tonight. Dang straight, we're talking about this because it's it's stupid. It's stupid that we have to. It is current year, okay, and we're sitting there turning clocks back to save time for what odd reason? For what point? Who cares if it gets dark at nine at nine p.m. or eight p.m. or six p.m. or five p.m.? It's just gonna go dark. It just, you know, I don't understand that why uh, humanity, whose souls are too weighed down much by gravity, once we travel through the, United, uh, through the outer space, <laughs> uh-huh. we're going to have to get used to some universal time. Why not start now? You know, why do we have to all have to be on, like, why, why do we even have time zones? Well, we want to make sure 8 o'clock is 8 o'clock. Why? Why does it even matter? Because my 8 o'clock is still not California's 8 o'clock. Okay, you science denier. Not denying science. <laughs> I'm denying the aspect of like, well, people want it to be sunny at noon, at high noon. Why? Stone says, it's the freaking sun. Let it do what it wants. I No, we can control the sun. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. But this. So there's a great podcast, a great history podcast. Uh, I'll mention two great history podcasts. The first being Hardcore History with Dan Carlin. I'll mention that later. But Backstory which is a program of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. So it's three professors from this university who do a podcast, and, and one is, you know, they're, they're, they're historians in different times of, of American history. And so it's always really interesting, and they did one called On the Clock. Uh, you basically have to Google it at this point. I don't think it's in their RSS feed anymore. But it is. I also learned that Warsaw, Indiana, was the first electrified town, the first electrically lit town town uh so they basically talk in in this about how railroad tycoons invented the time zones and so well well, let's give you let's give you a little history of time because i think it's pretty interesting uh or not so you have in the olden days in the 1800s before the late 1800s you everybody went by the sun so you could go from one town to a different town, and everybody's noon would be different. You could literally be the next town over. So, for instance, Greenwood is a mile from here, and I'm in Southport, mm-hmm. and then we're just south of Indianapolis. Each one of those three, who are geographically all very close, could have a different time, and it was all set based on the town clock mm-hmm. and the time that everybody just agreed that they'd work upon. And Seems reasonable. Right. And so you had uh, uh, railroads. Once railroads came about, everybody was working on different times. The Buffalo Station, for instance, had five different clocks, four railroad clocks, and then the Buffalo time. So there are five different (laughs) clocks with five different times in the Buffalo zone because – it depended on what ra- what railroad you were, you know, when we were going on horseback, it didn't really matter. Like people in 1850 didn't have the same kind of concerns about time and, and uh, you know, schedules that we have now. We have much busier lives. Yeah. Like if you think about it, <laughs> 100 years, 200 years ago, and if in 1850, if I were in the same exact spot in history – I would spend my day building my house, fixing my house, growing my food, and s- surviving, basically. Yeah. You, you, there is no capitalism. Like, I went today to go write fart jokes, mm-hmm. and then I came home and took a nap, and I had Chick-fil-A, and now I'm here on the internet talking. Like, <laughs> like I, I didn't have to s- forage for food or anything. Um, so uh, I guess it was Wabash, not Warsaw. Th- that Am I right? I thought it was right. Wabash, Indiana, first electrically lit town in America. Um, 
the uh, Facebook chat was trying to correct me. Um, so everybody had a different time based on where where the sun was and what they believed it was. And so the it really got started with the creation of the National Weather Service. Once the group of weather scientists start to put together the the, the maps and try to figure out fronts, well, it's very hard to study weather and climate and, and map it out and study fronts if you don't have some sort of standardized time. So if if you're not accurate in how fast that storm is moving mm -hmm. based on time, then it's very hard to do that kind of science. And so scientists started pushing for standardized time at the same time that the railroads were pushing for standardized time. So a group of railroad owners in 1883 got together and said, we're going to create time zones. And they decided to do it before Congress did it for them. Mm -hmm. And so they drew the time zones, the five time zones in America, in places that were advantageous to them. Okay. And so that's why – that's where the actual lines, the uh, vertical lines were drawn. Explain the Chicago-Indianapolis split. Exactly. So it, it, it's why we're on Eastern because we were still more of an Eastern city at that point in Indianapolis. There's a debate in Indiana whether we should be Eastern or Central. It's not a debate. Those people are stupid because it would be dark at 430 here Good. if we were on Who Central. Who cares? I will let you rant once I'm done setting up the topic. Uh, he's He's got a lot of feelings today. A lot of feelings on this specifically. Um, <laughs> so so uh, they, they draw these standardized time zones, standardized clock. And there was a day in the 18, early 1800s called uh, the eight, no, the late 1800s, the early 1880s called the Day of Two Noons. And the railroads, the rail cars literally would stop where they were at wait until the exact precise time and then leave so they would arrive at the station at the correct time. And people walked out and uh, <laughs> one of the jokes at the time was if you slip on a banana peel, it could take you 15 minutes to fall down at the right time. So people were standing there watching the clock and then when it hit noon, they were like, oh, okay, well. It, it was basically like memes back in the day. So they were all in interested in watching this one thing. Uh, so... <laughs> So that's slow moving memes. So it was it was the railroads that standardized time and set the term standard time and created the time zones here in America in the late 1800s. Fast forward to uh, World War One. There's a great article in the Libertarian Institute called Daylight Saving Began as Wartime by Stuart Jones. This was March 15th, 2017. That's a big thing. I, I'd say daylight savings time, and it's daylight saving time, and people get pissed. S suck it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the implementation of daylight savings time when we adjusted the clock an hour forward and backward was implemented in, in 1918, and it was called fast time at that time. And uh, Woodrow Wilson put it together in support of World War I. Seven months later, it was repealed by the majority of the states. And Franklin D. Roosevelt instituted year-round wartime in 1942. Daylight saving time was instituted in, to enforce to promote war and to give more time for people to produce. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, there was also in 1974 and 75, Richard Nixon signed into law the emergency daylight saving time Energy Conservation Act and enforced extended periods of daylight savings time to control energy and embargoes of oil. A uh, total of 70 countries take part in changing clocks twice a year, recognizing some for form of DST. This author says it's total madness. It's not total madness. All total right, calm down. It's a little hyperbolic. No, it's total madness. It's total it's crazy. madness. Current year. Uh, <laughs> while federal government has made the argument that energy savings stems from time change, independent studies have measured a loss in productivity. People are less productive when they lose an hour of sleep and are therefore more prone to accidents while their bodies are adjusting. Independent studies have found that sleep efficiency was reduced by 10 percent, car accidents increased by 17 percent, heart attacks increased by 25 percent, and the t change in time resulted in $434 million in lost production and medical expenses within the first week of that time change. So there are, uh, you know, there are parallels between the government's control and manipulation of time and currency. Regardless of the government's manipulation, changing the time of the day does not mean there's more time in a day. Yep. So 
it, and this is having worked in the radio industry. So in Indiana, we didn't change time until we were the last state. Hoosiers are very stubborn, and we refused to change with the rest of the country, except for like a couple counties in Arizona. Yeah. Refused to change time zones, and then when Mitch Daniels got in office, he's like, "We need to stop pretending this is 1834. Let's change the time zones because it's like we d- we didn't get a lot of new industry and business in Indiana because we didn't change the time, and there was a lot of lost opportunity economically because people could never figure out what time it was here. They were like, it was constant. It was so annoying. It was just like when and working in the radio industry where everything's set up on satellites and clocks." It was absolute hell for two weeks out of the year where you're trying to get yourself synced up on on these. You had to resync all the satellites. So it just was it was a pain in the butt. And on the flip side, this week where you lose an hour and you're waking up at, you know, you, you for work, you wake up at five in the morning, four in the morning, and then you've got to go back to three and four in the morning. It's really rough. I mean, so and I imagine everybody out there is feeling very tired, Harry, because they're. They've lost an hour of sleep. I'm feeling grumpy. I'm always grumpy this week. It's fall back. They gained an hour, actually. Whichever. Whatever it is. It's, it's, See, it's, you can't even get your conspiracy crap, you know. Okay, a conspiracy. Listen, here, here's my stance. Yes, it is stupid. Yes, it makes no sense. Yes, it is dumb. Denies the science. But what do I, what do I really God. care? There's people dying in the world. Change, just change the clock. I would, you know, that could be the thing that saves a lot of people, okay? Think okay. of the lives saved. Conspiracies, yes. Think of the lives saved. All right, so why are, you, why are you so against daylight savings time? For one, everybody, um, are you trying to tell you the mighty iPhone X can't deal with um, time? Like, re- everyone walks around with basically a pocket, pocket of sensors in their pocket. Sure. You know, it's a thin client connected to a bunch of servers. They all deal with time. These servers, everything, the Internet, is doesn't really run on the same time that we all run on. It's run on UTC. It runs on a universal time clock. That's what it really runs on. Right. Which wouldn't and have... Then, you, w- and would, then translates and then translate the time to where you are currently to give, like, a representation of a time that you can read. So you, you can look at your clock and go, hey, it's 9 a.m., but it's going to read it to basically off the UTC. But... All these times, these numbers are just arbitrary because mm-hmm. there's only a set number of hours of sunlight per day and so many hours of darkness. Okay. Does it really matter if uh, 12 o'clock is pitch freaking black if, you know, if there's still eight, you know, eight hours of daylight? Does it matter? What, but can you, can you not concede, Harry? That we wouldn't have gotten to this point had there not been a time standardization. A, don't you drink your spring your your Perrier water with your pinky up like that in my face? I take that as a hostile act. <laughs> he literally lifted up his can of Perrier water with his pinky in the air, and just had this little satisfied smirk on his face, as if to say, "You uncultured swine." <laughs> Yeah, but we, they, people also pooped in outhouses and didn't have electricity or iPhone Xs. Right. I'm going to call it the iPhone X. But without standardization, would you have gotten there? Would you know UT, what? Would UTC exist? You know what? The uh, the first car has nothing to do with the car, the piece of crap car that you drive today. You wouldn't be able to drive one of the first cars because it has all these stupid handles. But we don't do throwbacks and try to keep these all these handles around. No, Cadillac said, hey, you know what's better? Let's evolve and get a wheel and just a couple of pedals. Okay, move on. It's it's the thing of the past. <laughs> you know, it's like the stupid calendar. Why is it 2017? It should be 12,017 of the Ezekiel calendar. Okay, human existence has been on the earth for 12,000 years. Okay, you know the the ad idea that we go to 2017 from this stu- from stupid people back 2,000 years ago is dumb. Uh, you mean Jesus? <laughs> the stupid people like the Lord and Savior of all of the universe, Jesus. I'm just saying it's dumb to Don't count. you drink your pinky water <laughs> in my face after insulting the Lord. I'm just saying it's dumb <laughs> to uh, just do you know, like calendar time that way. If human beings have been on this earth for that long, we should count the years by that. It's simpler than trying to do stupid conversion. Was that AD or B or BC? And then you've got to count up for BC. So it's if if you're counting, so it's 250 BC, then it becomes 259 BC. This is dumb. That's stupid. 
Okay, you're, it's dumb. It, 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 like, uh, trying to go back and date when human beings began is <laughs> like trying to say when life begins. Like, you can say it begins at conception. Somebody else can say it, it's when the b- the baby breathes its first breath of air. Like, there there isn't a consensus on that. So, you know, the Gregorian calendar is doing fine. <laughs> it's, it's a dumb calendar, and it's missing years. Okay, a lot of the, th- the theories you also find out that the, a lot of the Gregorian monks are wrong. Like they like, felt like they've messed up. Honestly, thirteen twelve, we can get rid of that year. It didn't really do much for us. It was a waste <laughs> Gregor- of a year, anyways. So all, can we agree that Gregorian calendar is wrong? Can I? I will also agree that the current time clocks got us to this point. But you know what? It's current year. We walk around with a pocket of sensors in our pocket. We can evolve and move on. Sure, but the, the practically, and I'm busting your balls because oh, yeah. you're not you're not wrong. Like the oh, yeah, you have to be there and do that. It's gotta, it's gotta be there. The the legislative process and the arguments and trying to get people to change and uh, like it's just not even. Why is it even worth the effort? Like to, to get us to get Indiana to do something that benefited Indiana economically was like a marijuana was a well like going to DST was a thirty year argument that barely got passed and brought great economic benefit to Indiana when it finally passed. Mitch Daniels' darkest hour, actually. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, like, the argument was, on the other was, side, was just silly. It's was just, it was but, really like, the, the time clock that brought all the business here or the simple fact that Illinois sucked, Michigan sucked, Ohio sucked? You know, uh, and, uh, yeah, it was it was because Indiana has uh, a, a better tax code than those those places. You're right. Yeah. But it also when when it's as when it's as simple as I don't know what time it is there, then people don't want to do business there. Yeah. But they, back then I was like, what, like crappy Nokia phones? You know, my cur- your current phone, it can, you can drop it anywhere you want in the world. Then it would go like sync up to the GSM tower and tell you what time it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so current year that's a moot point now right it's dumb you know you can come over that oh you know time just for your freaking town this this is one of the the issues for libertarians though if we can't get people to agree on something as simple and as common sense as you don't need dst we're not farmers we're not right. well we're, we're at war but <laughs> not in the way that it's not like a total war society like yeah. it was in world war Two. yeah it, like we so don't what's the point of switching what's the point of doing this they right. the, the how do you roll that back? Yeah. And then, but the other thing is, right, is that you also, like, here's the other thing where I've, I, um, like, I, I don't think I'm the smartest man in the world, but it really irks me when I get with people in the largest complaint about day, daylight saving time is because they don't know how to switch their clocks in their car. Frustrates me when I get in someone's car, like, they didn't switch their time back right an hour. Right. And I just sit there and I go, you know what, and I just sit there and I do it for them. Well, th- that's like not <laughs> putting a battery in your smoke alarm, and so it constantly goes, boop. I, I like left, every 15 minutes, like that just is a sign that you're just kind of a dumb person or, or I left that into a, uh, uh, when I was doing a podcast one time, just to annoy a co-host and mm-hmm. kept doing it. And he, uh, he actually changed it on air cause he got tired of cause he refused to do it. Cause he, <laughs> like, cause he hated it. Can... <laughs> you could hear it in the pot. East pocket is like the beeps inside of it. It's, 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 it's hilarious. Like bit on it, but I just didn't feel like it. It, it, like to but me, yeah, the, you, the, yeah. the type the type of people who don't change their battery in their smoke alarm, or change their clocks in their car because they don't know how. Like those are the people that were going to get eaten by tigers right. two, five thousand yeah. years ago. Like we we've enabled these people to live, and we shouldn't do it anymore. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It, the world is too safe. We need to get rid of those type of people. They can't do that. <laughs> or like this one idiot that I saw on the highway driving with their like phone like right up on their face driving up. When I get when I see those people, I like to get really close to their car and then honk the horn so they think they went into my lane. Mm-hmm. So it freaks them out. They drop their phone and they get back on around. I'm like, good. I was FaceTiming somebody yesterday and they were on their they were FaceTiming me while they were driving and I'm just like. This is dangerous. Are you sure you should be doing this? She's like, it's, yeah, it's fine. I'm like, okay. Oh, dear God. Yeah, yeah, it's awful. Now, see, it wouldn't be so bad if they, like, some people were doing that in, like, tiny little smart cars, but a lot of them do that in these massive SUVs. Right. You know? Well, that's the place to do it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so final thoughts on DST. Keep, keep, this is your time to rant. I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm going to sit back here. I'm going to turn my. Um, okay, so my thing with da- daylight saving time or time in general, uh, it, first off, like I said, we all walk around with computers. Most people hit like probably like three different computers a day: their laptop, their tablet, their phone in their freaking pocket. 
come on, this thing calculates time for you. Most of you people don't even wear a watch anymore. Like, I, I have watches, but I don't wear them because, you know why? Because I carry this thing around. It has a time on it, and it's always synced up, and I don't have to wind it. You know, it's – I get it. I get it. Like, it's more of a, of a – I, I think the main reason, if it – the main reason people do DST is because it's a stupid government program that has left on, and it's too hard to get on the book. That's the biggest problem with everything dealing with – has to do with the government. It's so – to them, it's so easy to put something on the books. It's so hard to take something off. It should be the other way around. I still to this day believe if any law gets written in, in a book – each thing should have a sunset. Like eventually, this thing just expires, and if people want it back, they'll put it back on the books. Uh, you know, but yeah, what sorry. was the what was like in New York City? I forget what it was, but it was, I think it was dancing was made legal after ninety years in New York City last week. Mm-hmm. So, like silly things like that. Yeah, like, they had a cabaret license. Yeah, here in India, Indianapolis, uh, you you cannot sell your car with a for sale sign in your front yard, like. It's, Correct. It's illegal to just put a for sale sign in your car and park it on your front yard. Yep. Like you have to do it at a at or a do the process walk. on Sunday. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's it's bizarre. <laughs> like it, it, all these like you can't buy beer on Sundays in yep. Indiana. Mm-hmm. If you run a brewery, you have to sell food. So all the all the breweries, all the local like breweries have. If they don't have food, they ha- you you can get a hot dog. They have a packet yeah. of hot dogs. Or because the- it's. Law. Have you seen the places that have like the twenty five dollar hot pocket? Because no. you gotta serve food. Right. They don't want to serve it. They really don't want to do it. They just <laughs> wanna do beer. So we have twenty five dollar hot pockets. Is that where your favorite your favorite place they have? No, the favorite place I go and get beer on Sundays usually uh, they have a food truck out front. Mm. And that <laughs> we get food. That counts. We have food. It's our food truck. That's cool. Yeah. Uh which uh I would say the brewery, but they don't pay me money to say their name. So if they exactly. pay me money to say their name, I would say your name. We have, you know who you are. You like all my Facebook. You like all my Instagram photos. Thousands of people listening. You could advertise on this show. Yeah. We're taking advertisers, by the way. Yeah. I could drink your beer exclusively yep. or your sparkling water. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's move on to the shooting in Texas. Most of you have heard some of the details. I, I uh, want to, uh, long story short, a gunman, it was a domestic violence situation. A gunman walked into a Texas church and started firing there was actually a an employee, so I'm going to play a couple video clips uh, to give you uh, pr- probably a perspective that you might not have caught. Um, instead of us just sitting here reading articles about what happened, I think it, it might give you a perspective to hear from some of the eyewitnesses. Uh, this young man basically went into a church. The motive seems to be that he is uh, somebody who perpetrates domestic violence left his first wife, uh, then married a second wife, and uh, this was the church that her family attended, and it was basically to execute her and ended up uh, executing a lot of other people. So this is a KSAT employee. She was visiting her family. Uh, Erica Hernandez was actually across the street as she was visiting uh, her family. It's a very small town in Texas of, as of a hundred, you know, hundreds of people. And like seven percent of the town was killed in this shooting. So the second worst uh, violent act in a church in Texas after Waco. Yeah. So you you hear people talk about the worst uh, act of, of violence against in, in a church in Texas, the worst gun incident uh, in Texas history. Well, I don't I don't agree with that because right. I, Waco. If you really go and you watch some of the documentaries on Netflix about Waco, about what happened, and not conspiracy documentaries, yeah. like you, you don't even need to go watch the uh, uh, Alex Jones feed. You can basically just go watch the you know yeah. National Nat Geo and watch the Waco standoff, mm-hmm. and you see that the FBI, the ATF, Janet Reno, and Bill Clinton basically killed what a hundred people in yeah. a Waco church yeah, in a church burned them burned them alive crushed them with tanks yep it was a very awful situation spoiler the even the sheriff told him like hey do not spoiler do, alert yeah <laughs> don't go up there they was uh, the, 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 the sheriff goes like don't go up there in your tank don't go up there in like uniform these people are paranoid right. about the government just go in there in a suit and they will talk to you right that's not what they did that's not what they did and and so I think it is it's not something that the mainstream media is talking about, but I think if you aren't familiar with the Waco standoff, you really need to go and watch some of these documentaries to get 
uh, or, or read some books about what happened at Waco because it's uh, it, it it set off people like Timothy McVeigh. It set mm-hmm. off Ruby Ridge. It set off uh, it. it had its origins in some of the origins of the Tea Party and the alt right yeah. come from yeah. what happened at Waco? Yeah. The alt right, absolutely. Yeah. These are you kidding me? Yeah. Fucking lefties. Um, <laughs> no, no, the, the alt right is just they're literally alter, alternate lefties. Screw those guys. All right, so let's go to but this. Let's, the, uh, go ahead, I will sorry. say this: after you've seen all those documentaries, then you can watch the Alex Jones one. Don't watch the Alex Jones one first. <laughs> right, it's like machete order. Put that in the back. <laughs> All right, so here is uh, KSAT. This is a town outside of San Antonio. So this is a San Antonio station. Yes, that's right. We were the first on the scene. Erica actually was the first. So, Erica, when you first got there, what was the first thing you saw? Um, there was um, emergency personnel everywhere surrounding the church. At that time, they didn't even have a crime scene up. I immediately um, went across the street where the neighbors were located and were the ones who saw the suspect as he, they say, first... Um, started shooting from the outside of the church and then went inside the church. Um, They said he may have dropped anywhere from three to eight clips as he was firing. He had a lot of ammo on him. He had a mask, and he was in full gear. Wow, and so what were some of these neighbors saying was their first reaction? How did they how did they react? They were running for cover because as he was seeing people outside, he started shooting towards our homes as well. Um, one of the, the neighbor we, uh, I spoke to, their car had some gunshots to it um, because he saw them looking at them and trying to get his license plate number. At that point, another neighbor that lived a little further down returned fire toward him, and that's when they believe they hit him, and then he got back into his vehicle and left the scene, and, and some of those neighbors ended up following him until he reportedly crashed a little further down the way. Now, uh, now, what were the emotions that were going through some of these neighbors that you talked to? They are very um, panicked. They, none of these people have ever experienced anything like that. At first, they thought it sounded like, like fireworks. Outside, it was just a repetitive sound um, until they noticed the man outside um, firing into the church and then walking into the church. Um, that neighbor I spoke to um, later said after he left the scene that he did go into the church to try to, uh, to provide aid and he himself had to exit because it was just too much for him to see. Um, he, um, emergency officials on the scene are telling me um, there's around 27 possibly dead inside the church right now. Yeah, we just confirmed 27 are dead. Um, now, you were one of the first on the scene because you had a connection. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you have a, an EMS connection when you first heard it on the radio. You know, what was that like? Um, it's not something you hear around here. You know, you come out, I come out, came out here this morning. My family was in the area to have breakfast with my family. And to hear uh, scanners go off and say all, all units needed, that's not something you hear down, something that's not something um, that's common. And uh, when I got to the scene, it was not something I've ever seen before in this area. I grew up around here um, in, in Wilson County. And this is, again, this is not something you see every day here. And this is... This is going to be a big hit to this community, and this Sutherland Springs is about 13 miles east of Floresville. It's a very, very small community here. It's, it's a very small town. So for something like this to happen here, it, it's, it's just you never think it's going to happen here. And for it to be this town, Sutherland Springs, it's, it's just, it's something no one can fathom. And so you've been to this community. You live close to it. Um, it seems really tight knit. Uh, again. Everyone we've seen has been holding each other, really comforting each other. What can you talk to about that? The same. Um, I had a lot of people come up to me while I was one of the first on scene, you know, asking questions and wanting to know what's going on, that they had family inside. They needed to know where to go, what to do. Um, At that point, you know, emergency uh, personnel were just taking people off to the side and taking them other places just to try to confirm what they knew and who they knew may have been inside. Um, again, this is not anything anybody is used to seeing here. I don't think it's any worse anybody's used to seeing anywhere, in any place, in any town. I mean, we just got through reporting about Las Vegas not too long ago. Well, now. I mean, let's not say anywhere because, as Harry pointed out off air, this is a weekend in Chicago, right, Harry? You can you can talk. Yeah, not like a, not a shooting at a church, just like the the toll, the death toll. Yeah, I think what makes this different is that. Um, and not that it doesn't make it any better or worse. I mean, it's it's the loss of life that's tragic. Yeah. Uh, what was the final? It was 26 died and how many wounded? 20 wounded. 20 wounded. 
the pastor of the church was not there. He, they had a visiting pastor. That pastor was killed. The uh, pastor was out of town with his wife, but their daughter was killed. Uh, the grandmother-in-law of the suspect was killed. Uh, young, the youngest victim, I think, was 18 months old. Um, it was it, – it's one of those bone-chilling tragedies because you – it, 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 you're you're in a place of worship and you're in a large group and you feel unprotected although a lot of churches have security i mean a lot of synagogues have always had a lot of security mosques are start, starting to get security i think you'll start to see you know my church is a mega church with 3 or 4000 people a sunday and they have armed security there i mean and uh, police officers so uh, every church, I think, in this day and age is now starting to put together a security plan because of incidents like this and because of terrorism. But this is a small town church where, you know, we're talking about 40 people in a room, 50 people in a room. And, you know, it's why would you think that you would need security? Right. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it's an incredible small town. Right. Uh, so the the suspect he uh, he had let's talk about him a little bit actually let's uh, yeah let's talk about the suspect because I think this is something that uh, the the gunman was twenty six and right. he had a ballistic vest and a military style rifle and as well as a, a handgun as you'll hear later and this two handguns yeah so when when we talked about the Vegas shooting and we talked about mass shootings. The the largest death toll is, is is suicide. Second is gun violence, and third, with about seventeen hundred people, is domestic violence, and uh, seventeen hundred people a year killed because of domestic violence. And I'm I don't know what's happening. I think my Roku's going off. So if you can hear that, I apologize. <laughs> uh, it's just it free Terry and I out. We were like, are the aliens invading? <laughs> um, so. Bring me to your leader. It literally, yeah. Like, I don't know if you can do me a favor while I talk. Go find the – just turn the sound bar off. <laughs> so please, Harry, get the sound bar. So you have uh, – domestic violence is a very serious issue, and it's something that, that uh, I'm not surprised that this, this man was married to a woman. He beat her and the child, fractured the 18-month-old skull – went to was basically convicted of the abuse in the military he then was discharged one level like it wasn't a dishonorable discharge it was the next step down you know like dishonorable is the worst and he was the next step down and that wasn't put into the database so he was able to buy a gun and it is not uncommon that that sort of thing happens, sadly, because if you – domestic violence for me is a very sensitive issue, and sexual and domestic violence are two, two of my trigger points. And it, it stems from having a friend that I talked to in episode 141 of this show called Amanda. You can spend three hours listening to Amanda's story where she basically outlines how little help she got from the system, and if you're not – a raging anti-state libertarian by the end of that. I don't know what will happen, and the update is just going to piss you off even more. Like, no one would take her police report because, you know, he was friends with the local cops. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that the military, which has a very serious problem with sexual assault, didn't take th this case of domestic abuse seriously. Um, it, it it's, it's not uncommon – for abusers to get guns, and there's two types of domestic abusers. There's the guy that gets drunk, hits his wife, and feels bad the next day, and then there's this guy, the 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 man who perpetrated this this crime, a hunter, somebody who hunts their victim, and it spirals. And 90% of the time, uh, according to the local women shelter that that I talked to, 90% of that those cases end in one of the people or both of the people dead, and it, it's it's a very real issue, and I just don't – in so many of these things, there's so many – like we want to say do something because right. we don't want it to have happen, Harry. But there's literally no way that more gun laws could have prevented this. 
there's there isn't the, the, the system that is set up now didn't work and it failed all of these people it, and so increasing the size of the system i don't understand how that's going to make it work better it literally you can't fix issues of the heart like this is a person who is profoundly broken who grew up in a violent home allegedly like that's pretty serious stuff and there's there's just no guarantee that you're going to walk into your door every day at the end of the day. There's nothing the government can do to protect you from violence and the reality that every person has the capacity for horrible, violent things within them. Right. The uh, planet Earth is a violent place, but when it comes down to it, there's laws on the books that would have prevented this guy from at least getting the gun the way he did get it. Right. Uh, if the, you know, the Air Force would have reported it correctly, would have been in the database— you know, he would have, you know, he wouldn't have got that that gun that way, at least. Right. Would it have prevented the shooting? Who knows? We do not know that. But we know he would have prevented him from getting that gun from that sports store. Um, the Because he did try to go get a handgun and other things, like handgun, the carry permit. But, you know, that was stopped, too. So there was a lot of different laws on the books that this guy already got dinged on or would have been dinged on to help you know, try to circumvent this. There's a lot of different things that should have popped up. You know, like his charge on the difference would have prevented him from getting the body armor. That should have prevented him from right. getting that. But it, it didn't um, because it didn't get reported. And besides the only other law that even then, like if you would just say just remove all guns, there's still no case that, you know, whether or not this person would have had a, had a gun or not. You know, right. still would have prevented that shooting. You know, it's, and luckily that, you know, we didn't have a law on the book that kind of prevented all guns because a neighbor did come be, was a, a, did come out and we was able to uh, return fire, get him back on. Like most people, like, it's freaking scary to be on a two-range, two uh, two-way rifle range. It's freaking right. scary. And that guy showed how scared he was because that NRA uh, instructor started shooting back at him with his own AR-15. Yeah, so let's let's hear this. Uh, that guy's name was uh, Stephen Williford, and you're going to hear the voice of Johnny Lang Langendorf. Uh, Stephen Williford ran out of his house, started shooting Barefoot. at him. Die Barefoot, style. Uh, basically, they, some have reported, I've heard it reported that he hit the shooter and wounded him. But the shooter eventually, after uh, these two guys pursued, um, he killed himself after, you know, he basically shot himself, car wrecked. And uh, then they ran up to the car to make sure, you know, to basically citizens arrest. I mean, the, in, in a place of like remote Texas mm -hmm. where you may have one police or two police officers, you know, this this is the uh, – this is what the founders were talking about. Your personal security is – the Second Amendment exists not only to protect you and your family but also your community and also from a tyrannical government. And so what these two gentlemen displayed is the second leg of that three-legged stool of the Second Amendment uh, of community protection by wounding him because he, he was shooting people as he went in. He shot people inside. He was shooting people as he came out. And this guy stopped that. And so what you're going to hear is the voice of uh, Johnny Langendorf as he talks to CNN. Uh, two men shooting at each other. Yes, sir. The, the, the other hero tells you that this killer just shot up a church. He drives off. He tells you to chase him. You tell me, you say, let's go. Yeah. Did you have any second thoughts? What was running through your head right then? Nothing. Get him. Why? Because that's what you do. The other guy, anything you can tell us about him? Uh, you know, he, he's very much a hero. He, he, acted, he acted quicker than he could think as well. Um, he did absolutely the right thing, which was try and take him down on the scene. Um, you know, from what I know, you know, from what I know, he was just taking a nap and heard the gunshots and reacted. What kind of gun did he have? He, he had an AR-15. So they both, both the killer and the individual you drove had AR-15s? Um, the, kill, the killer, from what I heard, had a, had a pistol for during the firefight. Right. Which is the, the main part that I saw. And then, and then the guy with you, the other hero, had his own Yes, he had his own AR-15, yes, sir. And he came out, uh, he was barefooted. 
He was barefoot. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he he had no shoes on or nothing, but he was he was ready to act. And the moment police got there and everything, you know, he he did all the right things. So you, uh, I mean, a he looks like Richard Petty, uh, but because Richard Petty's cousin, he just basically says, "Well, I didn't think; I just did what I was supposed to do." Yeah, I mean, what, what's your what's your take on that? I mean, you're 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 very security conscious person. I mean, mm-hmm. what what's your take on what those guys did? That. If put in the same situation, I think I probably would have did thing. Would I would have performed the same? Probably not. Mm-hmm. That guy had a talking, um, hearing like the interview from the guy with the shooter. He had a lot of good like open um, peace of mind to be able to not, not be, yeah to do act in the situation mm-hmm. to keep calm. Um, I have never been placed in that type of situation. I'd like to know, be, believe that I would be able to remain calm and be able to act and to help stop that type of situation. But I don't know. Right. But. Uh, it was, it it was su- it's such a weird position to be in to watch this guy like to think about one pick up spare mags pick up spare bullets but forget his shoes mm-hmm. you know you know that's that's stuff you see like I said in Die Hard you know the guy just you know John McClane just runs out there you know shoeless you know right and watching the holes like the situation unfold like that it was it it had to have been like unreal because like this guy. The uh, one, the uh, when he came out of the house, like he, you know, he had his daughter with him. Right. He told his daughter to stay in the house, mm-hmm. and the other guy was just, you know, just driving around. Right. You know, you know, like, hey, this is going on. See, all this is happening, and just have that, and and it was like having your world just completely turned on its head just because you turned the corner. Mm-hmm. You know, if you just kept going straight, you know, that's just been something you saw in the news. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it's. There's really, like, when you're going into that type of situation, unless you're really set up or prepared for that, you know, most people would not have been set up fully for that, that position. That guy, when he came to shoot that guy, he went there to kill and do as much carnage as he could with the Kevlar vest. Because, like, I haven't heard any report. Like, he, uh, um, some people have seen a lot of reports saying, like, he had plates. Some people said he didn't have plates. Um I saw reports of Kevlar, but I don't even know if he had good Kevlar or if it was level one. Level, you know, well, the, but, the and, and, and if if it was like he actually had a Kevlar vest, like most handgun rounds wouldn't have went through that vest. Yeah, I mean the reality is that, like so. Luckily, the guy had a, like brought out that AR-15. We don't know how many. I don't know how many people are in the church. I don't know that anybody does. I haven't seen that reported. But let's say there are fifty Texans mm-hmm. in there. Somebody in that room probably had a gun. Most people do not bring their guns to church. That's a good point. Yeah, you know. Like, um, have have I brought my gun to church? Yes, I have. Did I feel, you know, I I kind of felt wrong having my gun in the church. Mm-hmm. And, and and if anyone there knew I had my gun, they would like, hey, you know, can you not bring that? And I get it. It's a place of peace, a place of worship. You know, right? Shouldn't bring your weapon. And that's probably also what happened there. Is like this is a place of worship. A lot of people don't bring their guns. That probably is going to change next Sunday. There's probably a lot of people concealing at church. Well. It- It's not just about having firepower. I mean, so much of this is here's a guy that clearly was known by the uh, I mean, community, the community. He he, he wasn't known in the community, but I guarantee that that uh, Rick Irvine says it's illegal to bring a gun to a church in Texas. Um, Here's a guy who has a history of domestic violence, who clearly is. You know, who was arrested for beating a a dog like the New York Times. There's a New York Times reporter that lives uh, in Colorado, pretty close to a trailer park where he lived. And, and the guy went out there the uh, yesterday to this trailer park. And like he said, uh, I, I listen every morning to the New York Times podcast. I forget it, what it what it is, but it's it's like a, a yellow and blue cover art. It's really good. It's uh Michael Barbaro sounds like a total, uh, as the kids would say, cuck. But it's really informative to kind of give the background on on some of these stories. Um, And so today's was talking to this reporter who went to this trailer park, and he said, uh, you know, a a, a lot of these people are transients. It's like they're they're people – this is in the middle of nowhere. It's just a gravel park in the middle of Colorado – and uh, most people have gone because it's starting to become winter, but there are a few who are just like their trailers are too decrepit to move, and those people don't want to talk to reporters. 
let alone because they kind of look like cops. So yeah. think think of uh, Maya, yeah. <laughs> where Maya's going to end up in thirty years. And basically, well, he he said uh, he did find one neighbor who happened to live right next door to this guy, uh, who, who's only twenty six, who had a pit bull chained to a t- uh, tree or whatever. There wasn't any shade for the dog. And then got the neighbors called the police when they saw the guy beating the dog in the head. And he's just clearly a disturbed individual who mm-hmm. is is known to this woman's family. The whole family probably had an awareness of what was going on if they were separated. And so a, a discussion in hi- – I mean it's always easy in hindsight because people don't want to talk about – domestic violence and my wife or my daughter was married to an abusive man and he's a violent individual and like who has those conversations but I think we need to get to a place in society where if you're in a church or you're in a a close circle you know Harry knows that everything that goes on in my life and and it's because uh you know you have to share community and part of sharing community is sharing the bad parts of your life and talking about domestic violence yeah. And getting out of domestic violence and then protecting yourself after after you're out of the relationship. These are these are key things. You know, when when Amanda was getting out of her issue, I would sleep at their house for six months afterwards to as security. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, just so somebody else would be there. Right. Uh, and another person to call 911, another person to uh, do something. Exactly right. You know, I, you know, one of us would grab the kids and escape. Mm-hmm. The other one would go confront this guy. Yeah. Like, you know, and you have to have a plan. And uh, I think now maybe the conversation needs to extend to uh, communities. But that's that's the horrible part about domestic violence is that it makes a lot of people a prisoner, not just not just the woman and the children or a man in the rare cases that that actually takes place, but also family members and there's places you can't go and there's things you can't do because of people's violent behavior. And it's, it's just, it's a, it's, it's an absolute tragedy. All of this is an absolute tragedy. And, uh, it just, you got to really think about who you're getting into a relationship with. I mean, it's 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 you you got to have yourself really rock solid in terms of your emotional life before you choose to get involved with somebody like this because it's it's one wrong one wrong choice, man. It it ruins the rest of your life. Yeah, and you've also got to be like unsure on yourself to be able to recognize that type of situation too. Yeah, you know, there's no need for you to go in a situation if you one don't know yourself, don't love yourself, mm-hmm. and don't and can't recognize that. Because yeah. you could just be a codependent, not recognize any of those symptoms until it's too late. Guilty, you know. Uh, and you know, and it and it goes for both genders. A lot of think of uh, th- there's a lot of you know men that were like um, to uh, probably poisoned to death from just from the same type of domestic violence and stuff like this. Mm-hmm. There's probably uh, doesn't it also go with just heterosexual couples. This is also there's a lot of of domestic violence in um, uh, the gay community. Um, but, you know, it's just more of a, like, just, just, it's part of the human condition, and a lot of it stems from, like, our, uh, like you always go on to our, uh, is our traumas and our, and our inability to discuss and to be able to deal with our traumas. Yeah. That's where it comes from. I mean, it, it really comes down to emotional health. Mm-hmm. So much of these discussions are about emotional health, and, you know, the left just wants to make it about the weapon and it's just right. you know after the truck incident in new york city with terror the terrorist uh the uzbekistan guy drove a truck or is uh what's his face uh the former presidential candidate herman Cain would say uzbeki becky yeah, becky yeah, becky stan uh <laughs> you should have been president he you know they were tr- now the there's a movement to ban trucks in major cities which is just ridiculous like that's where you need trucks the most to transport goods first off um if we could ban rolling coal take that Aaron <laughs> yeah but uh <laughs> you know you, but go ahead yeah yeah that that at least they're consistent on that <laughs> Give them the consistency points they want to ban something because they want everything to be controlled you know like it's it it's trying to make the world so safe yeah and you and i get it i get the i get the pursuit Mm -hmm. i get it i get the pursuit that's a noble pursuit but at what cost 
Well, I think Ben Shapiro in his latest podcast had an interesting point about some of this. Um, you know, the left looks at human beings and and they say, fundamentally, human beings are good. If we could just get rid of these certain, certain circumstances, we could have perfection. Hmm. And human beings it, it, it are going to not commit acts of violence, of gun violence, if we don't have guns. It, it, they distill it down into the tool that is being used, whereas libertarians, conservatives, people on the right more look at it like, no, people are complex. Mm -hmm. They're good and bad. There are good and bad. There's good and bad in everybody. Like I think for for me, I really – libertarianism not only became a uh, a political philosophy but also a life philosophy for me because it, it taught me that there isn't a, a binary like be before, when I was a Republican, everything was just good or bad. Right, you were left or right, good or bad, broke or mm -hmm. rich. Like there's no complexity to the world when you're a Republican, and you're just thinking in in all these basic terms. Like he, libertarians, when I became a libertarian, I started to really see the complexity of human beings, like in human interactions. Because once you start to put the individual at the center of your philosophy and start taking responsibility for your own core actions, that's when you start to see the complexity. And libertarians and republicans go, it isn't about the gun at all because this guy was going to kill them with a bat. He was going to kill them with a knife. He was going to kill anybody he could in whatever way he wanted. In Amanda's story, the ex-husband tried to kill with a bat. Yeah. You know, and then saw a shotgun in his face and came back three hours later with the bat and a crowbar. Like th that's the level of insanity that is going on with the with these abusers. And that's the problem. It isn't the tool that is the issue. It is the fact that human beings will never be perfected and society will never be perfected. You're not going to get a perfect outcome. And in fact, the more you try to use the government to create a perfect outcome, the more you're going to pervert the incentives that human beings uh, engage in and create bad outcomes. And so you look at it and go, well, we tried it your way and it failed. Like you're talking about the United States military, mm -hmm. the VA, mm -hmm. the local and federal agencies, the gun registry, like all of it failed. Like, None of it worked, so we're going to argue for more of what didn't work. So, and, and I'm not saying there's a solution because I don't think there's a solution, and that's the bad part about this. Like, I'm supposed to sit here in front of a microphone. Harry and I are supposed to give you libertarian solutions to these problems, and sometimes you just have to say there isn't. The only answer is to is is to, to the only answer is to fix emotional issues in society. And uh, try to deal with people on a, on a level that is healthy. And it's moments like this where you realize what is your duty to society. And that's why it's so disappointing. Um, so many like Keith Olbermann and some of these other people like I, I ran it a couple years ago about vibes and prayers. Um, I, I think it's. I think it's kind of nonsense to wish somebody good vibes. <laughs> like you're just ashamed to say prayer. You're just ashamed to talk about uh, your re your religious faith, especially Christians are ashamed because you don't want people to judge you. So some somehow it got morphed into healing vibes, which literally is a prayer, you know. And so thoughts and prayers became, you know, now it's like a a a punchline. So. Everybody after in the wake of the shooting, it started a little bit after Vegas, but now like the left is you know, this faux outrage, like take your thoughts and prayers and shove them up your ass, Paul Ryan. Well, ninety four percent. I I don't I need to pull up the uh, the actual statistics on this, but I think it was ninety four percent of people in the last three months, according to Barner Research, have said they prayed. And 55% of people, according to the Pew Research, uh, say they pray every day. So this is a praying nation, and it, it isn't a solely Christian thing. Prayer is something that almost everybody does in whatever way that they do it, and they do it to to make themselves better. 
Like it's times like these when you should be praying because praying recenters you and rededicates you to being a better person. And, you know, in almost every faith, prayer is about humbling yourself before your God and offering yourself as a sacrifice and a tool of their design. And that prayer then has the ability to move like God's not it, it's not like God is going to go, oh, Chris Spangle's talking to me. I'm going to do what he wants now. That's not how it works. It's literally like you're in right you're in the right relationship with your God. And so therefore he's going to move in your favor. And so if you're a a person of faith, then you believe in prayer, and if uh, if it's real, then it works way better than whatever self righteous bull s tweet that Keith Olbermann is trying to put out there. Like he's uh, like all these people bashing Christianity, uh, uh, which isn't smart when an atheist just walked in and shot up a Christian church. Uh, like it's such a bad political move to try and bash what most people. Like most people aren't you, Keith Olbermann. Most people are not you, Chelsea Handler. Like it's it, – most people are people of faith. Maybe they're not Christian. Maybe they're not uh, – you know, but they are spiritual. So yeah. it, it to me is just such a bad strategy and so insulting when you're going to bash people's religion when the whole point of prayer is trying to be better. And that's what we need at this exact moment. Yeah. Well, those type of people are always stuck in their echo chambers and – stuck in the coast and stuck in their they, they have an ocean by their window so they are smarter than flyover country people right so they know more than you and your bible belt is stupid but please vote for us and our candidates <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah it's i um to go back to some of your points it's the, the the thing that you get from what i think really happens to a lot of libertarians is that uh you really start thinking critically and it's always sad when you see libertarians not thinking critically because it's like you have to be a critical thinker to be a libertarian. It's just something that kind of kind of kind of goes with it. It's when you under start looking at different things of it's not a some things are questions of facts or questions of judgments where you have to make the best judgment. There's several different ways to do something and you try to find the best way. And Granted, libertarians are going to judge things just by liberty, not you know, not from other different facts. And you'll see a lot of different um, uh, libertarians that'll go like, you know, they're good, you know, commies are bad. Da 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 da. da. I was like, yeah, their inf- their implementation of a lot of different things are bad, but they can also have good solutions. You should probably read up on their stuff. You won't become a socialist if you you know if you read their book. You just know their position exactly. And once you know their position better than them, you can destroy them easier. Um, when it comes uh, to uh, Chris Murray's point here in the chat, a lot of people uh, are very lazy thinkers, so it's easier for them to regurgitate, memorize information than it is to take something inside, make it their own words, and regurgitate it, and, and then say something with their own principles intact. A lot of people, it's so much easier to take in a talking point and shoot this talking point back out. It's reason why you get chants like, uh, what is it, like the stupid word, like uh, homopho, anti-gay, KKK, Nazi, da, da, da. It's right. so easy to say stuff like that without critical, like critically thinking of like what's into that. And, into that. It, so, yeah, it's like calling uh, – I was watching Joe Rogan talk to Eric Weinstein. Oh, that's uh, a good one. Yeah, it was a good one. Very nerdy guy. Very nerdy. Very uh, – I would watch it on YouTube because it's boring if you were listening to it, I think. Uh, he, he basically is somebody who I think he has a writing association somehow with Ben Shapiro, uh, and Ben Shapiro wears a yarmulke all the time. Like Ben Shapiro is a very faithful Jew. So is Eric Weinstein. Mm -hmm. And like all these leftist writers just start writing about how they're Nazis. Right. It's like, okay, so the two guys who are anti-Trump and very like, very, really very Jewish, Jewish. Very Jewish. <laughs> are Nazis. It, it just does. It's so silly. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, and and some stupid Nazi alt alt right lefty losers started to troll Ben Shapiro's sister. So, like, which is awful, awful people, and it just shows you how like those tactics are. You know, they're they're freaking lefties. Well, uh, so here's if if make make another point before I move on to a different sort of connected topic. Oh. If you uh, were going to. No, I'm just like, uh, you know, like 
Yeah, no, I'm just gonna just call them. You know, but yeah, that's all I had on that. Uh, you talk about just like wrap, wrap it up on the shooting thing. Or no, 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 no. no. I, I want to. I'm. We'll come back to the shooting because I want to make another point. But I think it. I want to highlight something that goes into this beautifully, which ahead. is Go ahead. Th- this makeup artist in Turkey and all the cultural appropriation stuff from uh, Halloween still left over. And so there's this uh, makeup artist. This is on Ranker.com, which I will explain in a moment. And uh, it's, let's see, what's the title of this? This white makeup artist made a tutorial transforming herself into a black woman, and the internet is outraged. Michelle Nati, N-A-T-I, wrote this. And uh, let's just read this bad writing together, oh, if we can. Please don't. <laughs> when Persim Aiken, a makeup artist from Turkey... Prob- ball or uh... No, like the country where they probably don't, I'm sure a 20-something Turkey resident probably doesn't know much about American slavery 250 years ago. Istanbul, not Constantinople. <laughs> she probably doesn't know Turkey. about that whole Al Jolson thing. Um, posted a racially charged tutorial of herself in Halloween blackface. She was met with con- consternation from around the globe. Bloggers, vloggers, and social media users breathed a collective this again sigh as Aiken tried to explain herself. But as with other people who have feigned or claimed ignorance on the topic, she was dragged by social media to the point where she deleted her accounts at least for a little while and with good reason. While things seem to have blown over, there still are still people, especially at this time of year, who are posting costumes of themselves as different races. And that is not and has never been okay. There are plenty of things on Halloween that you could get get you into trouble in the costumes or some of them. These bad makeup ideas are offensive, and the Tur- Turkish makeup ideas are uh, artist blackface, blah, 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 blah. Uh, she just basically uh, – the, the thing that got her is that she put slave, hashtag slave, in the, uh, in the hashtags. But, I mean, she looks – she looks uh, – she looks, I don't know, kind of African. She looks cute, but she's a makeup artist. Well, she's, she's from Turkey, so she's probably not white. First off, right. Second thing, my sister and I got a theory about this. Okay, it's more my sister than I. She thinks that slave hashtag slave is a typo from the autocorrect or something. It's a typo, uh-huh. and she was trying to go beyond saying go slay. Oh, all right, well, maybe she's trying to slay. I mean, slay. because trying to go Beyonce. She because it's nice makeup, so she's probably trying to slay. So she is trying to slay. No, like. So who knows? It, it, here's the truth behind this, and this is what everybody she needs. Yeah, she did have 20 hashtags on. So yeah, she could have like, I, hey, I accidentally uh, took a picture of the RX8 one time and went Mazda, and I was like, oh crap! There's like <laughs> 3,000 other people have done it too, so I just kind of left it. <laughs> so here's the truth about these sites: things like Ranker, Provider, a lot of these uh, clickbait uh, sites. Uh, there's a guy that I just could not care for. Uh, less, more. I uh, don't like him. His name is Amiri King. I think he's divisive, and he is one of these people who just shit posts to get you to click on clickbait. And he's making two grand a day. I found out uh, <laughs> by doing this yeah, by just just being as offensive as possible by posting these sites like Ranker, Provider, all these different sites. And what happens is these social media guys get in bed with these sites through agencies, and they they have these writers who just write the most you know outrageous thing possible. So then the social media troll can then take it and can you look at can you look at this? Bull- I can't believe this. Blah 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 blah. And then everybody makes money off of the, you know, you go to a site like Ranker and just look at all the ads that you can accidentally click on. Oh, yeah, and well. that's how they all get paid. And so you have all these people who grew up, you know, in the last 20 years, went to New York City because they watch Sex in the City and they want to be Carrie Bradshaw. And they want to go and, you know, and, and on the opposite coin, they want to be Hunter S. Thompson. And they would go to New York City and they're trying to be writers and they're trying to get started. But they went to like a private college in Nebraska with. 1,200 graduates total, like, and nobody cares about their degree. Nobody cares about them. And so they go to New York City, and they get a job writing, and they get a job writing at some sort of clickbait mill, and they just tried to troll the Internet to find outrageous things. This this makeup artist has 5,000 Instagram followers. Like, this is a non-story. This is not somebody that is going to bring back blackface. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is not somebody that is... 
going to influence a lot of people to start dressing like Al Jolson. She was not trying to be offensive. Her intent was not to in, uh, offend. Her intent was to honor, if, if you believe what she says. So it's really just manufactured outrage for profit, and we've got to stop buying into it and stop sharing the stuff. It's like that's what all the kneeling stuff is about. It just That's what Trump is doing, and like Trump – Trump understands all of this, and that's why he's mastered it to such an effective uh, – he's mastered it all the way to the White House. So we we have to stop buying into this manufactured outrage. It's just all bullshit. All right. Two things. One, mm-hmm. uh, for those people that are like, ah, oh, ads, you're tired of ads, and you've got your ad blocker, and you still sometimes get ads. Um, I'll, I'll probably should record a video on this, but uh, if you use – the tech guys out there, you go to the website, they'll show you how to do it. You go to open DNS. They will show you how to put a ad blocker DNS on your uh, home router, which is really, really cool. It's also very good for people with kids. It'll help you also filter your content through open DNS, especially if you pay for it. It even gives you alerts if a device on the network is accessing bad sites. You get a list of all that stuff on there. Like I said, I'm just going to go click on that, move on. I'll do a later video on that. Um, the next thing I'll go is like, I, I figured you wanted to move to New York City and be a carry. I knew you knew you were a carry. <laughs> I'm more of a Samantha, honestly. Oh, really? Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm definitely not what, I, the redhead. What was she? Miranda. I'm definitely Miranda. not a Miranda. No, yeah. um, going back to the gun thing, uh, the other thing that's driving me crazy is that people don't really understand the politics of the gun debate, and it's actually not Republicans. Like, So Chelsea Handler has this incredibly – misguided stupid tweet as chelsea handler does chelsea handler is unfunny she's not clever she's not smart she's just gross yeah. and she's just i hate her so much like i go away. coming from the com- comedy industry it's like uh just awful uh and it's not because she's a woman it's that she's not funny she has no talent you know how she got her show on e she was dating the guy who was head of e at the time and that's how she got her show on E. Be careful, that's how you get shut down Gamergate. But yeah, just yeah. like everyone was like, Amy Schumer was funny when she was allowed to make fun of herself and she was allowed to be silly. That's when she's funny. Right, not trying to hold up a movement. Uh, so right. That's when she became unfunny. A lot of people like, what happened? Yeah, she stopped, you know, that's what's funny. It's People make fun it's, of themselves. It, but that happens to every major stand-up. Like, they get to, it's not Amy Schumer's sex that makes her not funny. Right. I mean, she was funny. She's not funny anymore. It happened to it happened to uh, Eddie Murphy. It happened mm-hmm. to Dane Cook. It happened to it happens to all these guys. You get to a certain point where you now get above where you were, and you don't have like you're on a different level. You don't like if you're a comedian, you don't want to get like to Adam Sandler level. Yeah. <laughs> because then what happens is your stand up, you get huge, you make a ton of money in movies, and then all of a sudden everybody starts attacking you, and then you're done. I would take the the Adam Sandler checks though. People, Hell yeah! I, I, I get to Adam. I'll take Adam Sandler. It's Love exactly him. right. Like <laughs> I, I don't mind being Dane Cook, but you know, I would, I'd be Adam Sandler or Dane Cook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like if your craft yeah. is stand up comedy, but uh, so Chelsea Handler writes on uh, November fifth around two thirty. Um, so Sunday, shortly after it happened. Innocent people go to church on Sunday to honor their God, and while doing so, get shot and killed. In what country? America. Why? Republicans. Well, Chelsea, let me tell you, uh, it's actually, you're not right in any way, shape, or form. The reason that further gun control never in the history of the uh, country gets enacted is because of moderate Democrats. And moderate Republicans are usually the ones who uh, give safe harbor to the discussion, but it's moderate Democrats in swing states like Indiana and a Joe Donnelly who, you know, or a Joe Manchin, in West Virginia or the the Democrat that's the senator or governor of Montana, like has him shooting guns in all of his commercials. Um, it, they are the ones who keep any kind of your legislation that you'd be for from passing. So re- blaming Republicans is really a dumb thing. It's totally dishonest and it's totally ignorant. And that's exactly what we would expect from Chelsea Handler when yeah. she's commentating on political issues. Yeah. And people keep going after the NRA, but the NRA is made up of four four million members. The NRA makes money off of uh, uh, gun regulation. That's how they make their money. Uh, Explain that. Uh, Just like uh, if they were to put a test into get your get to get your 
concealed carry permit, right? Mm-hmm. If they, if the United States government has no way to test the all fifty states to go to a test to be able to run that test, the only people that could do that would be the NRA. The NRA conducted test. You would have to sign up and go to the NRA to get their test. They would make money off that testing situation. Right now, they still make money because they do offer great, you know, like safety classes. They're voluntary. You can go to them. Or in a lot of different states, that you have to go to their safety courses. Right. You know? Just like. Uh, and I was like, well, they wouldn't make that much money off that. It's like, yeah, then make enough if you, you know, if you, because they'd probably write it in that you would have to get retested every two years. They'd make a money making scheme off this thing. Mm-hmm. They, I'm sure they've got it sitting there in the books, but you know, that's how they would, you know, and the, all the hysteria they make money off that. But that's all they are. And there's other gun lobby, uh, lobbying book uh, groups out there, right? You know, that does different things. Um, the other thing is, there's already. A, com- a gun control compromise on the books. There's common sense. We already have common sense gun control. We, you know, the compromise was n- no automatic wi- rifles. We, as much of an anarchist as I am, I was like, yeah, I could compromise on that. Then f- automatic rifles are freaking dangerous. I'm sat next to people who fire those suckers. Those are freaking dangerous. Yeah. Next to idiots. Um, like, the, like in every libertarian's mind, there's always, like, that one thing where you're like, like, for me, it's the smoking ban. Like, you know, I'm not for the smoking ban, but I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> I kind of like that we have How cigarettes. How dare you, sir? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, How dare you? Not for private clubs. Now, you know, but... I'm all for If someone wants to, I'm not for banning anything. If you want to have an automatic weapon, I'm all for it. I just think they're dangerous. Right. <laughs> I just think they're freaking dangerous. Right. Because a lot of people are kind of stupid. You know, people are dumb. Right. Uh <laughs> But uh, on the books, that that's a that's a great compromise. No automatic wife rifles. We can compromise on that. Cool. Uh, what about common sense? Hey, just want to do background checks on purchasing guns? Sure. How about that? Got to be 18 years old to get a gun? Sure. Okay. These seems like okay compromises. Right. Okay. These are compromises bought into their system. Do I like them personally as Harry? No. But are they a compromise? If I had to make a decision, gun to my head? Heck yeah. Those are, those are some compromises. I can deal with these sure. compromises. You know? But... You know, and that's the other problem is that the a lot of the Democrats they don't know the the laws in the books, and when they go to to talk about it, they're just so ill informed. They just don't know, right? And it's like, and it's and that type of thing that is frustrating. Well, and and there really isn't any compromise with them, and that's yeah, they, and we're all kind of stuck in the middle. But like, yeah, what what the left wants is just full confiscation, right? And they try to uh, sort of like, well, that's a uh, that's a fallacy. You're it's a slippery slope factor. You 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 think you you want a slippery slope? This thing, I'm like. No, 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 this isn't a slippery slope. This is what you want. This is what you're saying. This yeah. is what every one of your supporters write. Like, what do you think? What's the logical conclusion of what, what like a Chelsea handler is saying? Mm-hmm. W- innocent people go, they get killed and get shot. Why? Because Republicans. Like, she, right. w- what she is, the argument that she is advancing is that Republicans are in bed with the gun lobby and they're flooding the country with weapons mm-hmm. and so people are getting killed because of gun owners and there therefore we need to get rid of the guns it's what we talked about earlier like they think that they can progress us mm-hmm. to a certain point in society and it's a utopian fantasy we live in a country where there are more guns than people you're never going to mm-hmm. confiscate all the weapons you're never like you're never going to ban the sale of weapons. Right. Like what what I thought was actually it wasn't uh, clever in a way that I liked it, but it was clever. Like oh, you got us, you got us. Mm-hmm. Like was when Obama had all the federal agency buy all the bullets. Like there was no reason that the federal government needed it. Like the IRS and the Department of Homeland Security and all these, they didn't need the bullets that they bought. No. And but they completely used free market economics and the endless supply of money that they have right. to create a shortage, and but, that that's the kind of action that we'll see. You know, anti-gun politicians like Barack Obama continue to take, where they'll use the force of government to screw with the free market, yeah. or, or, or it's which, not a free market; it's the most regulated industry yeah. in the country. Which was cool during the time you saw a lot of uh, small. Ammo manufacturers get big during this time. Yeah, yeah. I, like you know, I went through. I started to buy ammo through like some small manufacturers. There's one they went out of business, but I love their ammo. Yeah, and they would deliver it to my house. 
I would give like feedback because there's such a small company I could give them feedback, and right. I go like, you know, there's a, you know, like I love your ammo, but like there's a lot of muscle flash out of this sucker, you know, and the, and you know, and next thing I know, I got another box that came to my door. They're like, hey, we fixed that. Yeah, that's awesome. I started firing like this is awesome. This is great. Send me, you know, yes, like, send me more. Keep sending me bullets. Yeah, that's you know? great. Yeah, and I was very sad when they went out of business. Yeah, that's rough. I mean, it, it is. It, prohibition never which, works for anything. Which, prohibition didn't work for booze. Prohibition isn't working for drugs. Prohibition isn't going to work for guns. Like it, it, it is. Yeah. It's just. It just comes down to ignorant ignorance. And like, I'm I'm ignorant of most firearms. No. Uh, <laughs> but I've been around them. I've never shot a gun. I'm not opposed to it. But like, I've been to gun shows. Like, I'm I'm. I'm ignorant and I'm in, I'm ignorant is that I don't know as much as you, mm-hmm. but at the same time I know what I don't know, yeah. and so I'm going to talk to people who do know what they're talking about, yep. and then I go, oh, okay, that seems to make sense. But it was I was I I would say all the same things that all these all your liberal friends are saying on Facebook until I became executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and then I knew it couldn't say those things because of political expediency, but instead of like. Being a hypocrite, I was like, I'm just going to open myself up to learn about this stuff, and I'm going to go to gun shows, and I'm going to hear what they have to say. And I I really, by being around gun owners for the first time in my life, went, this isn't scary at all. Like, Mm. I'm just being ignorant. Like, there's there's this whole world that I don't understand, but just because I don't understand it, it doesn't mean that I need to be afraid of it. Correct, yeah. Yeah, it just yeah, it's just, it, it, it. You shouldn't be afraid of the world. Just poking it. It's a tool like like anything else. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's. Yeah. I like how there's like no drunk guns should not be made illegal. Um, guns make people dumb. Without guns, people get smart. They cut. They get creative. And I don't like when people start to getting smart because the humans are dangerous when they start having to get to make weapons. Well, the, the, here's what the left the, the left makes libertarians and gun owners and conservatives out to be gun crazed fanatics but i bet if you really sat down and have had a conversation with almost every libertarian they would all say if if in a perfect world we could get rid of all guns and you you could get rid of violence i'd be more than happy to get rid of my guns like but that's just not the world that we we live in like it, it's it's not that libertarians are bloodthirsty and and want as many weapons as possible. They want as many weapons as possible because it's a hobby and it's cool to shoot them. Right, and, but, it, and it pisses off leftists. And, and right, and it's fun. But like they don't do it because they're they're starting a, a, a war. Yeah, I mean there yeah, there's some, but <laughs> idiots, <laughs> right. idiots, idiots that get expunged and kicked out of the. Uh, uh, movements different projects in new hampshire they get kicked out because they want to expunge too much violence yeah but you know like in a perfect world yeah but the strong if if you are at, if you ever ask me to disarm the strongest among us must disarm first right if you have the most guns you must disarm first before i ever get rid of rid of one of mine. exactly it is pointless to ask someone who is weaker than you to disarm first so That's that leads us into our final topic. We had a lot prepped, but we this was yeah, a good was conversation. A, uh, and became but, a Thursday show. But I feel like yeah, kind of, but that's all right. Uh, we've got a fun Thursday show. I've got uh, Shane Zolner and Dakota Davis from the Boss Hog of Liberty coming on. We're going to talk party infighting and my my scuffle with the national chairman of the Libertarian Party. They're like twins. Get them to wear the same shirt. That, that's going to be the prettiest podcast that we've ever had. And then uh, you on it to balance it out. Well, no, I'm the best looking of the three. But oh, sorry, you'll, sorry. You'll see why on the on – the, I'm also going to visit my lesser kingdom, the Boss Hog of Liberty, tomorrow night. So mm. make sure if you aren't liking the Boss Hog of Liberty Facebook page – Go do that. I will be live on their Facebook page with them tomorrow night as I join them for their podcast, and we talk about Dakota's bachelor party and all the fun that uh, I'm sure Jeremiah didn't let them have. Uh, so yep. be, be sure to check that out. I will be uh, visiting. Um, I will. Uh, Christy Avery is going to chauffeur me over oh. to the Boss Hog of Liberty as well. Nice, nice. Um, <laughs> faster, Christy. So speaking of uh, disarming uh, – Rand Paul basically became a libertarian parable. <laughs> he literally, he, he literally, like, 
forever libertarians at outreach events have been, well, if your neighbor comes over and you're lying, then you have the authority to go over and violate their nap after they've violated your property. <laughs> like, he literally began, so basically the, the story isn't out there, but I think what happened is that Rand Paul built McNukes in his backyard and he accidentally put his nuclear arsenal five inches over the line onto his neighbor's property. Uh -huh. And then what was, uh, then, then it became a Sorry. fight. So, <laughs> so, like, a really weird Pumpkin story. Chunky. Something's not adding up here, and I don't know what it is. And the fact that Rand Paul doesn't want to talk about it means that, like, these two dudes hate each other. Yeah. And so they're in, uh, Rand Paul lives near Bowling Green, Kentucky, and he lives in a hoity-toity gated neighbor, gated community, which is hilarious because you live in a gated community to keep people from breaking your ribs and attacking you. Let's be honest. His wife wants to live there. You can tell by this <laughs> whole story, like, he doesn't want to live there. Right. <laughs> And so, so he's in this gated community, and uh, he is an ophthalmologist. He works on eyes, for those of you who don't know what ophthalmologist is. And a retired anesthesiologist <laughs> who lived next door ran and tackled him mm -hmm. and broke five of his ribs and bruised his lungs. And, Harry, I've, I've broken a rib before. I broke a rib in seventh grade playing football. It was the most painful thing that I have ever experienced in my life, and that includes emotionally. Um, I've never broken a bone. I've got very dense, you know, black people bones. Black people they don't bones. Break. Uh, uh, have you? Luckily, he no danger the... to that extra one in your ankle, right? Correct. Yeah. Lucky he didn't like because he's an anesthesiologist. Lucky he didn't like try to Bill Cosby him and get him back that way. <laughs> so uh, they say it's over a, a, a landscaping dispute. Rene Boucher. Rand Paul was mowing the grass and wearing sound muting earmuffs and he didn't he didn't realize Boucher was Boucher Bobby Boucher was coming at him we're calling him Bobby Boucher and basically yeah he went <laughs> like, don't you talk about my mama uh, and so he ran after him he never saw him coming one friend said and the damage was severe. Five broken ribs, bruised to the lung. Kentucky state trooper showed up. Uh, the senator had small cuts on his nose and mouth and had trouble breathing. Uh, the 59-year-old the was charged with a misdemeanor count of assault. <laughs> and they're considering raising it to a felony, given the severity. Uh, Rand Paul's 54, which I didn't know. I, th I thought he was. I mean, I guess I realized he was in his 50s, but it doesn't yeah. seem like. Like 60 used to be really old. Yeah. And now 60 just doesn't seem that old anymore. It, it's not because of uh, Ron Paul and Bernie. But I, I doubt if he runs for president again, he uh, won't deny that Secret Service detail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the senator grows pumpkins on his property, compost, and has shown little interest for neighborhood regulations. <laughs> yeah, no shit. He's, Ryan, he's Rand Paul. Like, you knew what you were getting. Like, if I, would, if I was... Uh, listen, oh, yeah, broken jaw, too, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, that's new. That's what someone said. Someone said broken jaw. Chris Murray said broken jaw. All right. Uh, maybe. But uh, I, I don't. I hear about that, yeah. I, did, I, I cannot verify that. But either way, it's painful for the ribs. Yeah. But homeowners associations and all these regulations, they're all just so annoying. Yes, like, they they're are. just, I, I, I could never live in a place with an HOA. Because I would do exactly what he did. Oh, I can't compost? Okay, here's my giant pile of shit. I can't grow pumpkins? Oh, um, I ha I'm basically putting a Linus statue in the backyard. Um, I had to build, uh, I remember growing up, I had to build like a fence for the compost pile. I decided to paint the mailbox one day because mm -hmm. um, it was ugly. I didn't like it. Um, I didn't ask my parents. I just, you know, I had a bunch of uh, gold. Can of uh, gold paint because of uh, uh, Boy Scouts from uh, from uh, Boy Sc uh, from the Derby. Right. So I just yes, I painted my Derby car gold. Get over it. So I decided to paint the mailbox freaking gold. I thought it looked sh it looked sharp, and we got a letter in the mail. Oh, Chris said he broke his jaw. And oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, competing explanations of the origins of the drama cited stray yard clippings, newly planted saplings, and unraked leaves. Stray <laughs> lawn clippings. Stray yard clippings and. Uh. <laughs> They've looked, my nap. <laughs> Bobby Boucher lives alone, has for 17 years. They worked at the same hospital. So, like, and, and Bobby Boucher is, like, a hardcore, like, the Glenn Beck's people found out that he uh, had liked the Occupy Wall Street page, mm -hmm. which I, I, I like 10,000 pages on Facebook. I've had a Facebook page for 15 years. I'm sure that when something happens to me and somebody goes and looks at my Facebook page, you can pick out like 
I follow Barack Obama and it and and it's because I wanted to see what Barack Obama says. It doesn't just because he follows Occupy Wall Street doesn't mean that he is an Occupy Wall Street. He's an anesthesiologist, which out of all the doctors, they make the most money. Yeah. You know, he's a rich dude. He's probably not down with the Occupy Wall Street kids well, banging drums in New York City, not washing his feet for a seven he, he probably just wanted to hear the news about it because he's in freaking Kentucky. But right. I, I figured um, that's the main reason why you won't run for president when you hit 35 is because you're, you know, you're scared of what they'll dig up. Oh, but, yeah. As, but as just, some people in our group chat yeah. have seen, yeah. the, the screenshots from our private group where we make jokes are, are alone en- yeah. uh, enough to kill me. Well, the other thing is, like, he's lucky it was Ran, not Ron Paul, because Ron would have, like, you know, like backflipped on him and, like, really beat him up. He would have been awful. Yeah. He, oh, Ra- Ron? Yeah. Ron oh, yeah. is very spry, mm-hmm. and he's got an anger in his heart. I can tell he's a very sweet man, but he has an anger in his heart yeah. that burns. And he would just look at him. Waiting for the nap violation. He, like, I would think that Ron, Ron, yeah, as soon as you violate his nap, in his mind, he would transpose Henry Paulson's face mm-hmm. onto his face. <laughs> ben Bernanke! And then, <laughs> bam! <laughs> yeah. And then it was just all over. You got it man on him. I mean, basically, (laughs) Rand has the right under the non-aggression principle to, and that's what NAP means, non-aggression principle. Uh, For you new people, that is the foundational principle of all libertarianism. The non-aggression principle means that uh, you are not to, uh, you're not to harm another person, steal their property, defraud them. Uh, If they do that to you, then you have the right then to defend yourself. But you do not have the right to impede other people or interfere in their life. Um, and so in the, every libertarian party person takes the non-aggression principle pledge because Nixon thought the libertarian party in the 70s was a bunch of uh, commies trying to overthrow the government. And that was their way to institute that they were they were they were Americans and not terrorists. Did all of them take the. Um, not, not a Christian principle pledge. If you're a Libertarian Party member, you you have to have signed it, and and it came in it came in handy because Timothy McVeigh was a Libertarian Party member, and uh, Rob Schuford at the time came out and said, uh, "Yeah, he's not a Libertarian because he violated the NAP." So, so the non-aggression principle applied here is now that Rand has had five ribs broken, uh, he gets to light Bobby Boucher's house on fire. <laughs> and destroy destroy his world. Uh, so <laughs> the GQ, which is an article, is funny that that you said uh, it, <laughs> they just basically. Well, it turns out that Rand Paul's a bit of an asshole about his yard. <laughs> yeah, he clearly does not want to live there. He'd rather probably you know be happier like out in the sticks somewhere. You know, that's probably why he lives in Kentucky. But his wife said we need to live here. All right, so let's read what GQ says. Well, maybe this... I could be reading that wrong. I could be wrong. That probably is where Rand probably just likes to tick off people. He, he does seem like a shit poster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, GQ writes, so let's read between the lines a bit here. Rand is an asshole neighbor. He bought a house in a neighborhood that has certain rules with regard to lawns, and he decided that he doesn't need to follow those rules because of his belief in quote-unquote property rights, which I don't know why they need to put that in quotes, Yeah. Uh, that don't actually exist. Wait, GQ says property rights don't actually exist. They don't exist. So okay. I'm going to so – can we uh, start calling the podcast GQ now? Uh, this is by a guy named Jack Moore, and you look at his picture. He's, you know, he's just one of these skinny little dudes with uh, nerd glasses and a nerd beard. And, yeah, this dude's – We'll find his house and start yeah. moving in. You're not you're not Hunter S. Thompson, you dick. You uh, know, it gets, gets me over all these – I'm sorry. I've all these stinking leftists that want to be Hunter S. Thompson and stuff like that, but they stay in New- safe New York City or they stay right. in their hometown. I'm like, dude, he would be would not be here right now. Hunter yeah. S. Thompson would probably be in a you know like driving around in some beat up, crazy looking car and just driving around everywhere. Especially how cheap and he gets cell phone signal everywhere, right. type anywhere. Shoot, you think he'd be in town right now running for GQ? I would imagine Jack Moore is a male feminist. He would. He would just have a Twitter page and people would just follow that. <laughs> Libertarians don't want to follow the rules that we as a society have agreed upon because they feel those rules step on their freedoms. And sometimes they might even be right, but that doesn't mean that they are above those rules and can do whatever they want. 
Now, I don't want to excuse the other side of this, even though I kind of am because I hate libertarians and I don't understand them. One of the problems with Democrats is we've never met government oversight that we didn't like, and there's a good metaphor for democratic politics and the obnoxious homeowners association rules that drive everyone crazy. So it sure seems like this Bobby Boucher was also an asshole who cared way too much about what other, his other neighbor's yard looked like. Uh, I guess it was about politics after all. Uh, Bobby Boucher clearly was just successful and rich, and so he's bad. Like, the, uh, the, okay. Libertarians don't want to follow the rules that we of a society have agreed upon because they don't feel – because they feel those rules step on their freedoms. Yeah, right? Yeah. Just... Yes, he's not wrong, but – I didn't went, agree to these rules. I was born into I this. I was born into this, and I have the right to leave. I just have accepted that when it comes to government – You don't have the right to leave. Uh, I can leave. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Don't you tell me I can't do it. You cannot. You do not have the right to leave. <sighs> the United States government can de de say no, and when you do leave, they still demand money. Well, now I feel like a prisoner in my own home yeah. with my two cats. Yeah. Uh, I. But anyways, long story short, you do have the right to leave if you want to. You can try. Uh, Harry says you can't. But you can't, can't leave. Uh, try. I'm. Well, I can leave because I'm white. So my passport's clean. Oh, no, no. They definitely won't let you leave. <laughs> <laughs> they will not send me back. Yeah. Me either. They might let me go. Where are you going? i think about going to Africa one way, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it costs 12000 or more to expatriate, according to Rick Irvine. So, yeah, that's expensive. Yeah. But anyways, um, yes, we were born into rules that we do not exist and uh, that we did not agree to, but – if if you, I'm not I I'm I I'm not I haven't fully fleshed this out. So born I, into I, bondage, you, basically. But this bondage is way better than North Korean bondage, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. listen, I, I I wanted to make this point earlier, but I I'll make it now before we start wrapping up. Uh, so after I finish this, then I will throw it to you to wrap up. Um. I'm listening to the Genghis Khan series uh, by Dan Carlin on hardcore history, and I know I'm like a decade late or whatever, but it, it's worth the $10 at dancarlin.com. You haven't listened yet? I haven't listened. I just started this week. Oh, it's so good. Just started. It's, so I watched Marco Polo on Netflix, which was really good. It was, uh, the first season was really good. The second season, you could tell they cut the budget back because they only have like four tenths as their scenery. Have you, uh, have it's, you watched Spartacus? No. I tried, but I didn't get into it. Keep, keep, keep watching Spartacus and watch it alone in your bedroom. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's how the first season of Marco Polo was. Oh, yeah. It's like beautiful and expansive because it was their Game of Thrones answer. And then the second season, they cut the budget, and so it's like four tenths, and then they cancel the third season. So, But Marco Polo was really good, and so I got interested in Genghis Khan because Marco Polo spent time in the court of Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis. And so Genghis Khan was basically one of the, quote, like one of the greatest human beings that ever lived. He built an empire from basically China on, on the, the, from Korea to Spain. Like it was just up into Russia. It was just this crazy massive empire in the span of 25 years. He's probably the greatest general to ever live, but he's, he's also one of the greatest mass murderers to ever live. I mean, he probably killed anywhere from 10 to 50 million people in those 25 years. And so Dan Carlin calls people like him and Alexander the Great and mm -hmm. Hitler and Stalin these historical arsonists. You know, somebody, somebody like Hitler is a historical arsonist where he comes along and just lights the world on fire and completely changes things. And uh, out of that, we get things like Sykes Peacott, where you get the lines are all drawn. And then you, you, what, what we're feeling now, which is a very scary proposition, is the rumblings. Of the breaking apart of all of those, all of that world order that was put in place after the after the two world wars, where the lines were drawn without by by like like the Korean lines were drawn by Dean Rusk, an American lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. So you uh, you you have all of these rumblings of the world about to be set apart, and at some point, maybe in our lifetime, we will see a historical arsonist. 
it's not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not a f- Donald Trump would be a fascist if he could, but Donald Trump is not. He's this isn't a fascist country. Like the Supreme Court isn't letting him get away with whatever he wants with his travel ban. So, yeah. you know, he's not that historical arsonist. A dog is uh, there's two dogs fighting outside my door and Mittens just ran over to the door to uh see what's up. Mittens my 10 pound cat thinks that she's going to boss them around and get I them know, right? straight. Uh so well, so we're getting swatted. <laughs> so Jingus comes along and basically sets the world on fire and changes the course of world events in the 1200s. And he's also a great lover as Logan Knoll points out. He many 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 people are a descendant of Jingus. And so Long story short, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, James Neese included. James Neese is rapidly approaching. Yep, he's got Genghis J- Khan, and he's a point zero one black. Yeah. <laughs> so he basically goes through the Mongolian Empire and just talks about this, you know, and compares Genghis to the Nazis, and and really puts it in terms of yes, you learn history about something like Genghis Khan, and uh, you you learn about it in a very sanitary way. You don't really think about the human beings, and it's like right now the Holocaust is still fresh because we're two or three generations removed from the Holocaust. But what about what about 300 years from now? You know, people write about how Genghis Khan brought about religious uh, peace and was very open and tolerant and helped institute writing in a lot of places that didn't have it, and there are a lot of benefits to Genghis Khan. Well, what happens 200 years from now when people start writing about the benefits of the Third Reich? And, you know, he really hammers home the perspective of, like, how to look at history. It was just really eye-opening and expanding. And I mentioned it earlier in the episode where you're sitting there talking about, like, if I lived in this same exact spot in 1850 uh, or 1817, Mm -hmm. what would I be going through? I would be chopping wood. I would be surviving. I would be barely surviving. I would probably be dying, like – like I'm watching the end of Marco Polo after listening to Genghis Khan on a day where uh, on Sunday where I woke up whenever I wanted to in an air conditioned and heated home with clean air, repackaged wood, repackaged firewood. Like I didn't I didn't have to worry about the heat. I didn't have to worry about where I was going to find breakfast. I just walked out. I had all kinds of prepackaged food. I could make delicious pancakes. I had maple syrup. Then later that day, I I had Blue Apron where I was eating like Chinese cabbage and this exotic pasta, and you know it was this amazing meal that was inspired by three different continents. And I lived in security. I didn't have to worry about the king coming and and killing me. I didn't have to worry about it. It just it really put into perspective like how lucky we are to live in this time and place and. Yes, we have these mass shootings, but you're you're at a much better position than ever in history. Harry wouldn't want to live in 1817. Well, but, actually, you might because yeah. your your people are doing fine. You were, yeah, they were doing fine. You were selling people, not buying. You know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's really a great great time to be alive. You, no matter how poor you are, if you are listening to this. On the little computer in your pocket, and you're not that hungry. You're hungry, but you're not hungry. And then if you get sick, you can go to the doctor, and you go to Burger King and have a Whopper. Like, you live better than Genghis Khan did. Yep. <laughs> you know? and Or King George the Seventh. Exactly. Or, yeah. Or Henry the Eighth. Yeah. Most, most kings. Most, exactly. Most kings. Definitely better than all the peasants. Yeah. So we really need to put... Uh, Put our place in the world in a historical perspective, and I'm talking and more educated too. Yeah, I'm talking to somebody just because you can just simple fact that you can read. Yeah, I spent the day. That's part of it too. Thank you. I was watching documentaries and listening to things about Genghis Khan and then science. And like last night, I'm watching this Eric Weinstein thing where he's talking about the history of Indian music and mm-hmm. the history of Chinese music and biology. And I'm eating like basically the Blue Apron, which I cannot recommend highly enough. I love. I'm eating basically like this weird like version of Chinese cheeseburgers. It's like Chinese steam buns with pork and and, and black bean paste and 
and tempura sweet potato. It's great. It was a great meal, but like I'm what I'm just like this is the greatest life ever. Like I get to sit here and learn things over the time like time and space. It's just a uh, it's just really incredible and I don't think that we're appreciative enough of our time in history because we're so addicted to our phones and so like like I think there's going to be a serious conversation about putting our phones down at some point because it's ruining the human brain and ruining humanity and it's ruining my life. Yep. Rick Irvine is correct. We are kings, okay? He said uh-huh. it in the chat. Uh-huh. Translated for him. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. We yeah. are kings. <laughs> we were. No, no, we, we are. We are, we are now because we're not covered so in crap. I, I just, I really think everybody should go out. Dan Carlin, if nothing else, you you owe him $10 for the service that he's done uh, it, to to the world because his show is so great. It's worth it. Yeah. It is worth it. Yeah. It's it, it is more than you know. It's a better history education you would have got. You got through public school. Yep, and and he has got a the podcast hardcore history. It's free. It's just the old stuffs behind the paywall. So, uh, so yeah, great great stuff. Can't recommend that enough. I would also recommend uh, Jamie Kilstein was the head of Citizen Radio, and uh, a, li- a progressive podcast, and he was on Joe Rogan. Which God, I wish I could be Joe Rogan when I grow up. Uh, so good, and he was talking to Jamie Kilstein, who basically was part of the liberal echo chamber and super progressive and a male feminist, and he basically talks about what a prison that was, and then one of these websites like Jezebel, I think it was, Mm -hmm. basically turned on him and wrote this article about how he was a male sexual predator and, like, basically wrote a bunch of lies and it ruined his life, and, like, now he's contrite about all these. He's just basically asking, like, saying, I was wrong. All that stuff was wrong, and so a really, really interesting conversation, and I can't recommend that enough. Uh, Harry, final thoughts for this episode. I've been long-winded. I apologize. Super long-winded. Sorry. Uh, yeah, because I, I pulled up, you know. I, I I'm going bring... to just turn my mic off. You you go. You go. You go, boy. <laughs> boy. Whoa. I, Whoa. I meant it in Whoa. the fraternal way of the Whoa. 90s. I have to bring that up to wall management later. Whoa. Mm. I Ew. hope I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, just, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, one thing I did wanted to bring up is the uh, – uh, everyone, keep, we kept talking about the nap and the non against press. But I just want to bring – I've got a very small, concise version of the nap that I use over time when I have to explain it to somebody. So here goes. Every pony owns his or herself. And their labor. No pony else has a higher claim over them. Hitting, stealing, and killing are always wrong, even when the castle guards and soldiers are doing it. Use force only in self-defense or in the defense of some pony else. Each interaction with other ponies should be on a voluntary basis only. Never use coercion. Like I said, that's a small, like the con- um, concise version of. That's the virgin version of the. Uh... Of the non-aggression principle. Very, very small. Very, 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 very concise. Um, uh, my wrap-up thing is uh, what I wanted to go about is um, uh, I'm trying to hit everything. With time zones, you have small computers in your pocket. Uh, we're, the world is getting to a point that, come on, let's 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 be realistic. Let's get to, with the times. We have so many old rules on the book, like, for some reason, we think it's okay to have a bicycle on the road with a 2,000-pound car. This is dumb. They should not be – bicycles should not be next to cars. That's, that's, a, that's a dumb idea. Um, let's see. With the um, Texas shooting, uh, I, 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 I get frustrated and I get sick and tired of hearing all these different stories every, every time they come up, just like anyone else. It's – I don't want to say, like, this is it's just the normal, this is the way it going is, but it's only a tragedy here in the United States because it keeps happening. And it's uh, because it doesn't happen every day. It doesn't happen every week, just like they try to make it sound like. That's why you don't hear about all the deaths happening in Chicago. If you watch, just 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 get a local Chicago news source, like, find a station, and just watch it, and just watch how many people just die on in Chicago. It's like, this is not national, but, like, 20 people... Chicago wished it just had 20 people in a, week, in a month. Right. You know, that's ridiculous. Or in any other state, like, um, it's just in case anyone tries to bring up, like, you know, we need to get rid of guns. You know, they talk about Australia. Well, talk about Mexico because you're not supposed to have guns in Mexico, and Juarez is not a very safe place. Right. There's other places in the world with the exact same stuff like that. With the Turkish person, 
um, in the in, in the makeup. Uh, yeah, I think that was a nothing burger. Um, also, you know, there's there's so many racial insensitive things that we do here in the United States that probably piss the hell off of some people in um, Europe, especially Eastern Europe, stuff like that. When they use the G word, I'm not going to say it because that's an offensive word. You all those people up there of Romani descent, they know exactly the word I'm talking about. And here, stupid Americans use it all the freaking time. Gypsy. Whoa, dude! No, that dude. No, you apologize. That's a it's a very racial sense of fear. I, I won't apologize, but that's where the term gypped comes from. Oh, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, you know that? You, whoa, you just, you're just dropping like ra- racist terms all over this um, <laughs> podcast, aren't you? Everything's racist. I'm exhausted by it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't do it anymore. Like, I I want to I want to treat every person with love and respect, but I can't keep up with everything that's racist. Well, because race doesn't really exist. Exist the, the the thing that people think is race is just phenotypes, and they stop at a phenotype at a certain point. Right, like they just want to trace it back to a certain spans where where they're happy. Like mm-hmm. ah, my uh, uh, most of my relatives are here in Europe. Yeah, it, when the ice age finally started ending, yeah, they were here. But when before that, they were on the equator by Africa. Right, or they, they were frozen to death. <laughs> race is a false construct of society. Yeah, that you know, yeah, you know, and and there's. You know, like I said, it's, a lot of people. How can I get it? I just I get into the freaking race realist all the time, and it's just so freaking annoying. <laughs> Harry's out there doing battle like you wouldn't believe. The, they're the... annoying. Um, and I I use sock puppet accounts. I use I use my Harry account because I like to I like to let them think I'm white when I'm arguing with them. It's more fun that way. <laughs> more fun that way. <laughs> this. <laughs> Do you ever like get one of these sock accounts and just say the n word a bunch just to see like what it's like from the other side? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I really? do. I drop it all the t- I drop it sometimes. What's the difference in in how people react? Um, I think I'm more shocked when some people don't call me out and freaked out, or they just respond back. That's what freaks me out the most. That people just it's normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they just come back. No, it's very normal, Harry. Yeah, uh, like, when you're not around, it. Uh... The people just drop it. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I mean, it's true. It's, it's like, it's like the Trump on the bus thing. It's like. Uh, I got bad news for you. That's how your husband probably talks at work. Mm-hmm. You know, like, <laughs> like Possibly. it's it doesn't mean that that people are going to take those actions or that they actually mean any of that. Mm-hmm. But you know, ha- a lot of times people are, are. I mean, like the thing that that's crazy is I was watching a KKK documentary on Netflix. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. It's it's okay. Uh, uh, it's not as not as great as I'd like it to be. But uh, but you're just like some of these people you can tell. Mm-hmm. But then there's other people where you're just like, oh, that guy's like a dentist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you never think about like all the 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 people that you run into in your daily life that are just like super racist or like well, like they're like like some guy and he's just like a slave to you know yeah, <laughs> BDSM yeah. slave or something. Yeah. And the thing with the South is very weird. Like when you start looking at different like things also started happening one like in the early nineteen hundreds where like um because the South became less racist as it became one mo- one more Republican and Christian. Right. Two, the South also became um, less racist when they just started discovering, like, the uh, uneducated Southerner was d- was from a uh, parasite worm that everyone basically had in the South that was eating their – that wasn't, like, letting blood go to their brain, so they actually wasn't getting, like – w- Wait, say that again? <laughs> uh, my, 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 my brain – Zon- zonked out, and then I, I heard there was you parasite. This, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. There's like was a thing like a uh, like a parasite uh, that people were catching down in the the southern states, and it you know so that whole idea of like dumb southerner well will mostly because that that um, they got all got affected by a parasite. It was their brain function wasn't working all the way. What? Yeah, it's nuts, crazy That's- stuff. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And that happened around the same time as racism also started to, you know, slow down in the South as well. It's Some, like, somebody, like, see if you can research that and hashtag wall news that and put that out there because that's, that's interesting. I'd love to read that and send that to some of my Southern friends like Bittner. Bittner, yeah. 
Mr. Mr. says he has an IQ of 180. Mm-hmm. He probably does because his family was probably was held back by this parasite. You know? <laughs> he was yeah. homeschooled, so he didn't drink the school water. Right. You know, his family probably got hit with this parasite. You know, like his, par- his family's probably like had this highest intelligence at 80, right? But it was like probably was 180, but get the parasite <laughs> ate it down to 80, you know, just and enough not to eat enough lead chips and made it to that point. And now he's keto. Yeah. And it's all over for him. Keto sucks. I've been I did keto for a long time. I lost a freaking lot of weight, and I'm done with it. I love my rice. Yeah, oh, I love oh, my God, rice. I love, and I love sushi. my beer. Oh man, sushi rice oh, is the man. best. You know, I oh, I just I, I see if I had to if I wasn't a dad, I'd probably stick on keep uh, stick on the keto so I can keep the abs out. But right, but dad, no, I can work on the dad bod. <laughs> I just <laughs> you, have to do curls. You don't care anymore. Yeah, I just have to do curls. Somebody uh, order this man a cookie. Yeah. Uh, the other thing um, before I could go like. Uh, um, shout out to the uh, Discord chat. Um, um, like I said, um, we created a safe starter zone in the Discord chat because we realized um, when people were coming in, we dropped them right into the DMZ, went hard in the paint with memes, and we were like, huh, maybe we should scale this back and put you in a starter zone because when you drop in a starter zone, it's just like prison. You've got to figure out what faction you want to be. Do you want to be on the fourth Reich thousand year of ponies? Or do you want to be, you know, with the PC gaming master rates, the builder burgers? You know, you got to pick your gang when you jump in the Discord chat. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. We have fun in there. It is. Uh, uh, it's um, um, they was the only moderation I've ever done in there was the create that channel. So understand that the mods are Rob uh, Galt, who barely does anything, and um, James Neese. So those are the mods. And there's a fourth, right? Um. Uh, Christy. Christy, who's basically she's not a mod, she's the, the super, uh, she, she's basically super user in there. She's the main person that can ban and kick people out of that chat and delete comments. She has the most power under dear leader. I think. Right. Yeah, I think it goes you, Harry, me, and then I think Christy. I gave you the ability to delete the server, not her. Okay. I didn't give her the ability to delete the server. I gave you that one. I think that's so, the only thing that separates you. And two. why would you give Christy Avery, our only super duper fan, that power? Because I trust her, and she would not allow anything to happen inside that server. That one will have people send any shoe people to my door, or and I can trust her because if something happens and I can't get there, she, she I know she'll act on my behalf, or at least for the good of Wall. And right, she's she's got our back forever. And if Christy Avery deletes you, then you, you oh messed yeah, up. oh yeah, Christy has. If Christy decides to get on Discord, see something, and ban you, you. Whoa, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do? Christy didn't know she had this power. We shouldn't have told her. It what might go to her know? head. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Crank call. Crank call. Crank call. Crank call. Uh, so go- she's going to kick Neese out next time. So this is from PBS. It came from uh, – so we have a Facebook group that we stream the show live to called Dear Leaders Court for everybody who's a $10 a month and up Patreon subscriber. Uh, Howie Worm gave the South a bad name. Uh, this is from April 2016. Uh, for more than three centuries, a plague of unshakable lethargy blanketed lethargy, blanketed the South. Uh, began with the ground itch, a prickly tingling in the tender webs between the toes, and was soon followed by a dry cough. Weeks later, victims succumbed to an insatiable exhaustion and an impenetrable haziness of the mind that some called stupidity. Adults neglected their fields and children grew pale and listless. Victims developed grossly distended bellies and angel wings emaciated shoulder blades that accentuated by the hunching, all gazed out duly from sunken sockets with a telltale fisheye stare. The culprit behind the germ of laziness, as the South's affliction was sometimes called, was the Nectar Americanus, the American murderer, better known today as the hookworm. Millions of these blood-sucking parasites lived, fed, and multiplied and died with the guts of up to 40% of populations stretching from southeastern Texas to West Virginia. Hookworms stymied development throughout the region and bred stereotypes about lazy, moronic Southerners. Uh, as the South rid them of hookworms, these parasites cost the region decades of development and bred widespread misconception about the people who live there. Uh, it still exists. So that's really uh, interesting. Wow. Mm-hmm. It, it is so interesting how something like that, like you, Crazy. like. We don't understand like something like nature can have that kind of societal force, uh, and and really shape the course of history. Like we bl- we blame it on certain factors, but it's actually like they're sick. Yeah, yeah, they're just sick. Wow, just sick. That's Interesting. It. Uh, any other thoughts? 
Um, yeah, just shout out to just yeah. That's all I want to do. Like, if, I, I if you want to on... join the Discord, you can join at wearelibertarians.com dot com now. Yeah. Oh. So it's up on the front page of the website. Sweet, sweet. sweet. So you, you can find it there. Um, now that you got the radio thing, I'm, I'm going to see if I can get a bot to pipe the radio feed. Uh, uh, I, you're probably going to mention. I know I'm trying to send mm-hmm. fire on that, in that, but the radio feed into the Discord vo- uh, to a Discord voice channel, so you can kind of listen while you're on the Discord. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So if you go to uh, wearelibertarians.com on the right hand side, we are libertarians radio. There, we're streaming 24 seven. All the episodes of We Are Libertarians. You can also get it on Apple Radio within the iTunes app on your desktop. And I've submitted it to TuneIn, so you could probably you'll be able to get it there soon as well. I didn't find a Google Play edition uh, for Galt, but yeah, WeAreLibertarians.com. You can listen to a twenty four seven stream. I I've caught a couple episodes. Like I caught the debate recap uh, that we did. That was really interesting. Um, we I caught a conversation Joe Ruiz and I had about parenting and DCS stealing some children. Really fun way. Like what I like about it is that you go back and you hear things that you you like you wouldn't have picked that. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the reasons I want to do it because I've had like these streams on, on other shows that I like. And like you would never go and pick that episode, but because YouTube or the radio station pick that you end up getting exposed to something that you wouldn't have ordinarily heard. So that's why it's kind of cool. It just It's a 24-7 stream of all the wall shows, and uh, it's at wearelibertarians.com. We Are Libertarians Radio. Look for it in iTunes and soon uh, 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 tune in radio. Uh, editor's note, this is important if you've had any problems with your podcast. Let's say you're in a podcast catcher like Google Play or Stitcher or TuneIn. And something happens to your feed, then you need to go and re-add it because I I went through this weekend and I I intend to leave something called feed burner. Uh, I realize I'm cutting into Harry's time. This is what's going to be my final thought. I'm it's, sorry. It's okay. Go. All right. So feed burner. Sorry. I uh I just got a lot to say tonight. Um. FeedBurner is a Google product, and Google famously just kills stuff off. Yes. And so we we use a company called Fireside to host all of our podcasts now. And uh, because of your donations or your subscriptions, I'm able to pay for that cost. And we've had various locations for hosting podcasts in the past. Everything is now cleaned up. So I've deleted all the old podcasts. You can hear all the archives at SoundCloud. But if you have a problem with any of the feeds – then go to wearelibertarians.com and grab the new RSS feed. So if at some point over the next month something happens to We Are Libertarians and it stops updating, you need to go grab the new RSS feed. Uh, you can actually – you'd probably be smart just to delete this and re-add it now uh, at wearelibertarians.com. So the reason I'm doing that is that if Google kills off FeedBurner – We'd be hosed mm-hmm. because they just will shut it off, and uh, I want to get us on a more reliable platform. So that feedburner.com slash we are libertarians feed is now wal.fireside.fm slash rss. That's what it looks like. So, so all of the other podcasts have been transitioned to Fireside, have everything updated at the website. I've updated it in iTunes and uh, all the back end stuff like – I spend hours working on the back end tech of this stuff. It's it's a little crazy, uh, but I do it for you because I love you. Yeah. So just in case you have experienced some sort of issue with, let's say you listen to Boss Hog of Liberty and Google Play uh, or Miranda's World and Google Play, and all of a sudden it disappeared, then you need to go re-add it because we had to re-update everything. So it's a huge pain in the butt, and I'm, I'm paranoid we're going to lose subscribers. We probably will, but... I'm telling you now, update your feed. So, all right, guys, thank you so much. Harry, any final thoughts? Need need more Miranda's World. Uh, Yes, uh, we've got quite an update coming uh, as soon as the lawyers clear the episode. (laughs) 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 All right, thank you for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Christy Avery, Craig Doolittle, Jason Doolittle, our $100 a month subscribers. Uh, and our $10 a month subscribers, Brantley Spicer, Joey Tarner, Pete Jones, Carly Ernst, Brandon Kester, uh, Christian Emmons, Dan Dunbar, Doug Stream, Chad Oakage, Chris, 
Christopher Brokoff and Todd Singer. I have sent out the posters. They will be arriving at some point this week. Can't wait for you guys to get them. These are collector's items. If you you should join at twenty five dollars a month just to get the poster because what I'm sending out will never be duplicated again. You will never be able to get it again. I'm even thinking of upgrading all the branding to of We Are Libertarians from the gray, uh, all, all the Stalinistic <laughs> block art. Yeah. Uh, so these these may be the last batch of posters that I ever collect. So you want to join at twenty five dollars a month on Patreon. And uh, get yourself a poster, and I will send it out to you. And thank you to Christy Avery for helping put those all together. All right, thank you. We love you so much. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your shares. And we will see you on Thursday. And until then, be good to each other. All right. Are you going to?